Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Neighbor kept parking on my property, so I had him towed. Backstory I'm a single mother of two teenage boys and I live in a nice quiet neighborhood at the end of a cul-de-sac. Every house on this street has a garage and I'm the only one that has a single car and parks in my garage. Almost every house on this street is a family home with at least three cars, but most have more. Some will park in their driveway and some will park on the street. It's never been a problem since everyone is considerate on how they park and no one has ever had an issue with getting in and out of the street. In addition, I tend to keep to myself. I'm not antisocial and I wave and say hello to my neighbors when I come and go from my home, but usually when I get home, I stay home. So I say all of this to give you an idea that I'm a homebody and my neighbors pretty much know that when I get home, I stay home. About six months ago, the house to my right was sold to a larger family that consisted of dad, mom, and three teenagers. The day they started moving in, I made a point to go over to the edge of the property to wave and greet them in order to welcome them to the neighborhood. They were friendly and I was happy to have such nice people to move in next door. Also note, the dad used their garage for storage and thus parked their four cars in the driveway. I didn't know it at the time, but their youngest son was just months away from his 16th birthday. Now that you have a little information, onto the story. The players. We've got me. We've got entitled neighbor dad. We've got the entitled neighbor son. And we've got the entitled neighbor mom. And we've got the poor nice police officer. Today is Monday afternoon, and this story began last Tuesday. Around 6 p.m. on Tuesday, I received a knock on the door, and it was neighbor dad. Following is our conversation. Neighbor dad. Good morning, how are you? Me, talking through the screen door. We're okay. I'm sorry I can't open the door, but my youngest came home from school with a sore throat today, and so I'm not sure what's going on with him. How are you, and how can I help? Neighbor Dad. I'm sorry to hear that. I hope it isn't anything serious. We're okay. My son just turned 16 a few weeks ago, and I'm sure you saw the new truck we bought him. Me. Yes, I did. It's such a pretty truck and big. Does he like it? Yes, he does. It's what he wanted, so we got it for him. It is very big. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Let's take a brief pause here and understand that when I say this truck is very big, it is very big. It's an F-350. I personally think it's too much of a vehicle for a kid learning to drive, but it's not my money, so to each their own. Me, nee, I don't understand. Neighbor Dad. We've been having complaints from some of the other neighbors that his truck is so big that they can't get around it when they are driving through and we're afraid that it might get sideswiped if he continues to park it in the street. Me. Yeah, I've had some intense moments trying to get around it myself, but I'm sure he will get better at parking as he gets more experienced. I'm not sure what this has to do with me. I haven't complained. Oh, I know you haven't complained, which is why I was going to ask if he could use your driveway to park, since you don't use it. Me. Very stunned at this. Um, I do use my driveway when I leave and come home. I can't get to my garage without using my driveway. Besides, I have issues with depth perception and your son's truck is so big, it will take up most of my driveway and I don't want to be responsible for any damage that might happen while it's on my property. Neighbor Dad Well, we will make sure that he parks it in a way that allows you to come and go without any issues. Me That isn't possible. The only way he can park to allow me to get around him is if he parks halfway on my lawn and that wouldn't work because then he would damage my lawn. If you're concerned about his truck getting damaged, then why don't you let him park in your driveway and then one of your other smaller cars can park in the street? We've already discussed that and we would have to park two cars in the street in order for him to use the driveway. It would be very easy for him to park in your driveway and I can assure you that it will not be an inconvenience to you. You don't even use your driveway. Me, I'm sorry, but the answer is no. I'm not going to be responsible for his vehicle on my property and I need to be able to come and go without worrying about someone else's property. Neighbor Dad, very upset at this point. You are not being very neighborly. I thought you were a nice neighbor. 
You don't use your driveway, and this would benefit the whole neighborhood. Me, losing my temper at this point. Listen, I told you no, and I do use my driveway. Every time I pull into my garage, and every time I leave. I'm sorry you don't have enough parking for all of your vehicles. I'm sure it's frustrating, but it's not my problem that you decided to buy a vehicle that didn't fit at your property. Now, while I also find it irritating to try and navigate the road with that truck in the way, it is public parking, and so I deal with it. I will not have anyone else's vehicle parking on my property. Now, if you don't mind, I have a sick kid and need to go get back to him. Have a good day. With that, I closed the door and then looked out the peephole and saw him give me the bird before he turned to leave. I just shook my head and had to take a moment to understand that I actually just had that conversation. I then loaded my son up in the car and left to take him to minor emergency to get him checked out. All tests came back negative and I was told he probably just had something run of the mill and to keep him home and do self-care. Was told to bring him in if it got worse but not to worry. I went to work the next day and told my coworkers the story of my neighbor's request and they were shocked. I had one coworker suggest that I send an email to my HOA to explain what happened just to get it on record because it was such an odd request. I took her advice and typed up an email that day when I was at lunch and sent it. For those who want to know, it was just an FYI email, not a complaint email. It basically stated that my neighbor made a request to park on my property and when I declined, he got mad at me and I wanted it on record just in case anything ever happens. So very glad I did. So Friday comes and my youngest son has been homesick since Tuesday afternoon. When I got home Friday evening, I checked him and he had begun to run a fever and was complaining of several other things. I had been doing self-care with him since Tuesday and he didn't appear to be getting any better. Around 7 p.m., I decided to take him back to minor emergency and loaded him up into the car. I opened my garage door and I was absolutely shocked to see that very big F-350 sitting in my driveway blocking me. I can't describe to you how angry I was to see that vehicle sitting there. Now, before anyone starts asking me how I didn't know it was in my driveway, it's because my street is very busy and cars are coming and going all the time. And unless someone knocks on my door, I don't bother watching every vehicle that drives up and down the street. The only window that can see my driveway are the ones in my kitchen and I keep those curtains drawn and never look out of them. So I get out of my car and stomp over to my neighbor's house and bang on their door. Neighbor mom answers the door and this is the conversation. Neighbor mom, irritated and kind of angry. Can I help you? You are interrupting our dinner. Me. Your son is parked in my driveway after I told your husband he couldn't. I need to take my son to minor emergency and that truck is blocking me in. It's at this time that neighbor dad walks up behind neighbor mom and proceeds to talk. Neighbor dad. He isn't blocking you in. You can get around him. Me. No, I can't. You need to move that truck or I'm going to call the police and have a tow truck come over. I need to get my son to see a doctor. Neighbor dad turning to call for his son and then turning back to me. He's not blocking you, but I will have him move it. Me. It doesn't matter whether you believe he's blocking me or not. He's not allowed to park in my driveway. No one is allowed in my driveway. And if I find an unauthorized vehicle parked in my driveway again, I'm not going to bother knocking on your door. I'm going to have it towed. It was at this time I saw the son arrive at the door with his keys in his hand and I turned to leave and I head to my car to wait for him to move it and I heard him call me that famous B word. I ignored him and headed to my car to watch as he got in and after some effort, finally was able to back out of my driveway and parked his truck in the street a little way down the road. I was able to leave and take my son to minor emergency where, as we waited for several hours to be seen, I shot off another email to my HOA about what had just happened. I want to advise, the HOA had already responded the day before that they received my email, made a note of it, and advised my property was my own and I could give or deny access to it as I wish. It was this email string that I responded to while waiting for my kid to be seen. Again, all tests administered to my son came back negative and I was told it was just something run of the mill and that he would be fine. It just had to run its course. I took him home and called it a day. Saturday evening, my oldest started complaining of a sore throat and I was starting to feel poorly myself. My youngest appeared to be getting better, so I figured that whatever he had that we were getting. So we stayed in all day Saturday and Sunday. 
Sunday evening at about 5.30, my oldest son spiked a fever, and while it came down a little, it didn't come down enough. So I loaded him in the car and off to minor emergency we went. The only one I could find that was open on Sunday at this time was on the other side of town, so I had to drive 20 minutes just to get there and we ended up waiting for 3 hours to just get in the door and then another 45 minutes until we saw the doctor. After a few more hours and all of his tests coming back negative, the doctor did state that she could hear some wheezing in his lungs and so she prescribed an inhaler for him to help him but basically told me the same thing that he has something run of the mill and to let it run its course. I had to drive even further to the only 24 hour pharmacy available to pick up the inhaler and we did not get back to my house until almost midnight. Let me set the scene for you. My son is half asleep in the passenger seat and complaining that he just wants to go home and I am exhausted and feeling drained and having coughing fits myself and I'm just looking forward to going to bed when I round the corner and saw that truck sitting in my driveway. I couldn't even pull in because he was blocking me and I also noticed that he was parked partially on my lawn. I was so mad I could hardly see straight. I googled and found a 24 hour tow truck service and explained that I had an unauthorized vehicle on my property that I needed towed. The woman said it would be about 30 minutes before they could get a truck there and I said that was fine. In the meantime, I walked my kid to the house and put him to bed and then quickly went outside and took a picture from the street to show how much of the driveway he was taking and that he was also parked on my lawn. I couldn't understand why they would park in my driveway again after I had told him no and the only thing I could come up with is that since there had been no activity at my house for hours that my neighbors probably assumed I was in for the night and wouldn't notice the truck in my driveway. This is pure speculation but it's normal for me to be in for the night especially after 6 p.m. I don't know if they missed me leaving or just saw me leave but figured I was home but it really doesn't matter because I told them they couldn't park in my property. It was about 12.30 a.m. when the tow truck arrived and I half expected my neighbors to come running, but there wasn't any activity from them and the driver left with the truck without incident. I went in, shot off another email to my HOA along with pictures and an explanation that I had towed the vehicle and then went to bed. At 6 a.m. this morning, I woke up to someone banging loudly and rapidly on my door. I didn't have to look, I knew who it was. I grabbed my phone, hit the video record button. Before I opened the door, I looked through the peephole and saw a neighbor dad and his son at my door. I opened the door and the following is the conversation. Neighbor dad, very angry and yelling. Where is the truck? Me, as calmly as I could state while coughing. It was towed. You can call such and such company to make arrangements to get it back. You didn't have the right to tow it. You're going to pay to get it back. Me. I had every right to tow an unauthorized vehicle on my property. I told you not to park on my property and you did it anyways. It blocked me from getting in my driveway last night. I told you I was going to have it towed after the last time you parked here without my permission and I won't be paying anything to get it back. Neighbor Dad. You stole my truck, you jerk, and I'm calling the police. I'm going to sue you. Me, having enough of this. Go ahead. In the meantime, I'm sick and I'm going back to bed. I closed the door and stood there for a moment. I looked at the peephole and they were still there. Neighbor dad started banging and was also ringing my doorbell nonstop. He knocked and rang my doorbell for another four minutes before he gave up. I'm still recording all of this and I didn't turn off the video when he was gone. I turned and saw my kids standing there. The noise had gotten them up and I just advised that if they were still feeling ill to just go back to bed because that was where I was going. Now, I will honestly say that I didn't think he would call the police, but he did. It was about a half hour, I really wasn't looking at the clock, that I heard the doorbell ring. I got up and looked through the peephole and a police officer was there. I opened the door and had the following conversation. Nice police officer. Good morning, ma'am. Sorry to bother you, but we had a report from your neighbor. He's stating that you stole his son's truck by having it towed from the street and we need to talk to you about this issue. Me. Good morning, officer. My neighbor is only telling you half the story. I had his truck towed this morning from my driveway when I returned home from minor emergency. I couldn't get into my driveway and I've already told him twice that him and his family can't park on my property. This issue started last week and I have emails to my HOA, pictures of his truck parked in my driveway this morning and a video of my neighbor's visit this morning where he called me names and told me he was going to sue me and call the police. I can show you if you'd like. Officer. Yes, so you're saying that the truck in question was on your property 
without your permission and that you had it towed? Me. Yes. Last Tuesday, he asked if I would allow his son to park in my driveway. I told him no, and he got mad at me and flipped me off before leaving. Then Friday evening, when I was leaving, I discovered his son had parked in my driveway and I couldn't leave my garage. I went over and demanded they remove the vehicle, and I told them at that time that I would have the truck towed if they parked on my property again. I came home late this morning, and the truck was in my driveway, so I had it towed. Officer, I just want to confirm, you're saying that it wasn't parked on the street, but in your driveway, and you have proof of this? Yes, sir. If you give me a minute, I will print off the emails that I sent to the HOA that documents the issues, and I will show you the pictures in the video as well. With this, the officer said that he would wait for me to print everything off. Once I got the emails printed, I then returned to the door, opened my photos app to the officer to show him the truck in my driveway, time stamped, handed my phone and printed emails to him. After looking at the photo, where you could clearly see my house in the background, the truck blocking the entrance, and that it was partially on the lawn, the officer then read the printouts. He handed my phone back to me and asked me to open the video that I had referenced while he went over the lawn to look. I watched him look at the area and then take a few photos. I could see my neighbor and his whole family standing in their driveway watching me and the officer. Officer returned and I handed him back my phone with the video ready and he watched it. After he finished the video, we had the following exchange. Officer, I'm going to need a copy of that photo and video from my file. If I provided you with an email, would you be able to send it to me? Yes sir, no problem. I have enough information for my files to determine that the vehicle was not on public property and was in fact on your property. I've made a note that you did not give permission for the vehicle to be parked on your property. Based on the emails you gave me with dates and times, it appears you did in fact advise your neighbor not to park on your property. Would you like to file a trespassing report for this incident? Me. Oh, absolutely. Officer, I can see you're not feeling well. You can either file with me now or you can go online getting business card out, writing on it, and then handing it to me. Here's my business card with the email address that you need to use to send me the photo and video, and the case number is on the card as well. Do you want to file with me now? Me. Honestly, I'm exhausted and would prefer to file online later. Officer. Okay, reference this case number when you email your evidence and file the online report. Also, reference my name in the report. One more thing. I saw in the video where a neighbor's dad stated he was going to sue you for having the truck towed. He can sue you if he wants, and I would advise that you keep all of the evidence you provided me with today along with the case number I just gave you. Give it a few days and you can request a copy of the report and you will want to keep that as well. If you decide to file an online report, you will need to keep a copy of that as well. I'm going to go talk to neighbor dad now and sorry to have bothered you. Me. Thank you, officer. I'm sorry you had to come out. Have a good day, ma'am. Get some rest. With that, I closed the door and went back to bed. However, I'm so mad that I didn't get any sleep. A few hours ago, I sent off my photo, video, and another copy of the HOA emails to the email address the officer gave me, and then saved all of that information just in case. I also filed a trespassing report online. I then sat down and started typing this story. Not sure where this is going to go, but I am going to see it through. I know that I'm going to get a lot of pushback from people saying that I should have just knocked on their door and had them move the truck, but I feel that I was right to have the truck towed. I had already told them twice not to park on my property and it didn't stop, so this was the consequence. I will post an update later if there is anything that comes of my report or if neighbor's dad does actually follow up on his threat to sue me. If you read all of that, thank you and again, I'm sorry for the length. Update. OMG, this thing blew up and I'm just amazed. Thank you for the awards. I had posted this because I was second guessing myself and thought maybe I had let my sickness and anger outweigh my judgment, but your comments have made me feel secure with the decision I made. I have so many comments that I can't respond to everyone, so I wanted to address a few repeating comments that I saw. 1. This is a real story, and if you don't believe it, then that's on you. 2. Yes, I live in a quiet neighborhood and my specific road is busy. There are 12 houses on my street. Busy road doesn't mean noisy. I guess I caused confusion when I said I was at the end of the cul-de-sac. I'm the last house right before the cul-de-sac starts, so I consider myself at the end. Cul-de-sac doesn't mean no traffic. I still have neighbors and guests to drive by. 3. Cameras I don't have any cameras and I will have to save up to get some, and based on the comments, I will make that a priority. I have to budget to get extra stuff. My neighbor across the street has cameras, 
and I'm almost certain the front of my house is covered by them. There's no way they can cover the front of their property without getting the street and my front yard covered. This doesn't bother me, and when I'm feeling better, I will go ask them about the coverage. 4. I did take a look at my HOA paperwork, and it does mention that street parking is acceptable, but only if it doesn't impede traffic. I'm assuming that since some of the neighbors made a complaint about the truck, that the HOA must have said something to him, which is why he was trying to use my driveway. This is purely an assumption. 5. For those telling me I should have damaged the truck in some way, I just can't do that. Was it wrong for them to park on my property? Yes, but that doesn't mean I have to be like them. I'm satisfied with just towing the truck and the report I filed. If things don't escalate, then I will call it a win. If they do, then I will certainly respond. Don't misunderstand me, I'm not a pushover. I will not start anything or escalate anything unnecessarily. But if they escalate, I will stand my ground. 6. Yes, myself and my oldest are still sick, but getting better every day. My youngest was able to return to school this morning. Entitled mom tried to have me sent to military school and blew up in her face. After the last time I stood up to my mother, she seemed to get more wary of how she treated me. So I just continued with my usual routine of school and odd jobs. My 15th birthday was right around the corner and my dad presented me with an engine kit for my bike to help me get around town in. He said I was better off saving for a car than a scooter and this would do in the meantime. I ended up agreeing with his logic and kept saving for a car. A few days later though, I found a pamphlet for a military school while sweeping grass off the back patio and mowing the lawn. It was on the ground and under a chair near where my mom liked to sit and drink wine. I had a bad feeling she was cooking up some kind of crazy scheme, so I waited until my dad got home to show him what I had found. He was pretty mad, but didn't jump to conclusions. So he went to see my mom with the pamphlet and asked her about it. Dad, honey, what's this? Mom goes white at the sight of the pamphlet. It's nothing. I've never seen it before. Dad, really? Because if you were planning on trying to send Craggle to military school, you know I wouldn't allow it. That's when mom broke her facade and yelled, He needs to learn some discipline. He locks his door all the time, and I can't even spank him anymore because he's too big. This is the only way I have left to punish him for being a disobedient brat. Dad, Craggle did nothing wrong when he stood up to you because of your stupid favoritism. If anything, our daughter is the brat because of you and the way you spoil her and let her get away with stealing from her brother. And as far as I'm concerned, this discussion about sending Craggle to military school is over. And if you try to send him, then so help me, I'll bring the hammer down on you any way I can. Mom, well, I guess this whole family is just going to take away what little power I have left in this house then. If I have nothing, I may as well be nothing. Dad, you and I both know you'd rather keel over than be nothing. Stop being so dramatic that Craggle is growing up and is his own man now with his own money. Mom then stormed out of the room. The next morning before school, I saw her furiously trying to stuff something into the kitchen trash bin. I waited for her to leave for work and dug out whatever she was trying to hide. It was an application for the military school filled out entirely in her handwriting. It required the signature of both parents or legal guardians on it, and there were two signatures on the paper. I recognized mom's, but the other looked like a pitiful attempt at trying to replicate dad's. He prided himself on his smooth and complex signature, and there's no way my mom could copy it without looking like a fraud. I guess she realized that after she was confronted and gave up on trying to send me away. I kept the papers and showed them to my dad later. He was mad but figured she had done that already and let it go. But he filed the papers in his office just in case. A few more months later, it got out that my mother was having an affair with an old ex-boyfriend of hers from high school. That was the last straw for my dad and he filed for divorce and I went to live with him months later after he bought another house. He sped up the divorce pretty quickly by pulling out the military school papers that my mom had forged his signature on. And it wasn't just that. He also had evidence she forged his signature on at least one credit card application and one other thing that I don't recall. That made mom fear being arrested for fraud and they went through court pretty fast because she agreed to most of his terms. Mom got the house because dad didn't want it but she also demanded alimony and child support because my sister unsurprisingly chose to stay living with her. The judge awarded my mom the child support and a minimum amount of alimony for a decade of monthly payments. The alimony basically just covered my sister's allowance anyway. Mom was pretty mad about that and threatened to take him back to court, 
but he held those forged signatures over her head for years to make her back down. On the day I left to live in dad's new house, my sister stuck out her tongue at me and smugly said, mommy told her that she was a princess and the more deserving sibling. And that's the reason why I was leaving the house. I just shook my head and told her to think what she wants because I didn't care anymore. Then walked out the door, finally feeling free as a bird. My relationship with my sister when she came to visit dad's house once a week only got worse after that until finally we stopped talking altogether for years and I didn't really care to visit mom's house. She pretty much gutted my old room for a home office anyway. Entitled Mom Lets Her Son Destroy a 100-Year-Old Antique Table I, 24 female, previously posted in another subreddit about one of my mother's younger friends, an entitled mom in her early 40s, who I first knew as carefree and wonderful until she had her first kid. That kid ended up becoming a complete brat with her mother's encouragement. But Entitled Mom had another kid, a son who is four now, who I kind of liked because he wasn't as intense as his older sibling. As of last night, that has changed. For context, my mother's greatest joy in life, other than her kids, is antiquing. She dresses every room in her house very carefully and will stop at every vintage shop around to find a piece of furniture, sometimes using road trips to find new antique stores and examine what is inside. I used to hate going with mom to these stores, but since she took all three of us kids and told us that these used to belong to other people, I think it gave us an early respect for other people's things. We were never the kids to break stuff or jump on furniture, in our homes or anyone else's, and I'm pretty sure that contributed to it. When she was pregnant with my oldest sibling in 1990, mom found a small circular wooden table with three curved legs topped with a circle of marble. The shop proprietor told her it was 70 years old, so she bought it for a song, shined it up, and stuck it in her living room, where it immediately became a staple of our house. The coffee table lasted her through three kids' college graduations, a move in 2000, and countless family parties and events, still shiny and looking new and gorgeous. It's as much a part of the family now as any of us kids. Now to last night. Entitled Mom's birthday recently occurred, so she had given Mom a birthday celebration last month. Mom decides to return the favor, inviting Entitled Mom, her husband, and their kids to our house for lobster. Already, I'm not a fan of this. Whenever Entitled Mom and her kids come over, my mom makes a serious effort to give the kids something fun to do while the adults talk. We have a collection of coloring books, blocks, dolls, Legos, puzzles, action figures, and a TV in the basement from when my siblings and I were growing up, and mom even bought them some new toys herself. But inevitably, the kids will play down there for two minutes and then come to their mom to complain that they're bored, then proceed to wreak havoc on our house. My parents, who entitled mom sees as her kids, aunt and uncle, have warned the kids many times not to jump on things, but they do not listen. The oldest kid is also very combative and likes to pull hair and hit people as I learned firsthand, and broke a holiday decoration given to my dad by his late mother. Of course, Entitled Mom coddles her kids and coos they're the best in the world and all that BS. I've told my mom repeatedly that I don't want to be around the kids or their parents, but she brushes it off. In fact, she likes to tease me for not interacting with Entitled Mom and not coming downstairs when Entitled Mom visits and says that Entitled Mom shouldn't get in the way of me living my life. I live with my folks and am invited to attend the party but make my usual choice of opting out. Since I've just finished the first week of a new job, I intend to celebrate with a day at the bookstore and a night with friends. But yesterday morning, as I was preparing to leave, mom asked why I was going to leave her to deal with the two kids by herself. I told her that I wasn't going to let them get in the way of living my life. She laughed and wished me a good day and I left. My day was wonderful. I spent the morning and early afternoon at my favorite bookstore, the evening with my friends at a wine bar, and the night with them at a karaoke room. I came home around 11.30 that night and enter from a door in our sunroom where my parents are asleep on the couch watching TV. I wake them up, tell them about my day, and they seem genuinely happy. It went so well. To be polite, I ask how the party went. My folks get quiet and look at each other, and my mother, sounding very drained, tells me to go into the living room the next room over. Confused, I look through the doorway and immediately see why. The beautiful table, now a century old, is broken. Its three curved wooden legs were bisected and splintered, 
There's a small crack in the marble top, and a collection of wood shards litter the carpet. What happened? I asked. Earlier that day, around 6.30 p.m., my dad, an entitled mom's husband, went to pick up my grandpa, plus a steamer for the lobster. While they were away, mom had worked to settle the kids in the basement and reminded them not to jump on anything, then gone to the living room to converse with entitled mom. As they are talking, my mother leaves to go to the restroom at the other end of the house. She stops in the kitchen before returning and hears a crash in the living room. Mom runs in, and lo and behold, son had become bored, come upstairs to the living room and started jumping on furniture, including the ancient table while Entitled Mom watched. My mother is predictably horrified and stares as Entitled Mom examines son for injuries and reassures mom that the kid is fine. Mom gets sick to her stomach, takes son aside and tells him in a serious but not yelling voice that Auntie is very disappointed in him and that he knows the rules at her house. Entitled Mom overhears and berates Mom, telling her that she is the only one who can speak that way to her kids, before coddling Son and telling him that he's going to be okay. Mom then outright asks Entitled Mom if she herself told the kids not to jump on furniture at our house. Entitled Mom replies casually, No, I didn't tell them not to. The husbands return and all three men are shocked. Entitled Mom's husband immediately offers to pay for a carpenter to fix the table which my mother accepts. Dinner goes on, but it is cold and impersonal between mom and entitled mom. This morning, entitled mom, son, and the husband came by our house to give mom a bouquet of flowers, an apology, and the number of a carpenter who they'll pay for. She puts on a smile and says thank you, but is very upset nonetheless. My dad doesn't want the kid in our house until he's older. Mom says she'll be keeping her distance from entitled mom for the time being since she can't teach her kids to respect other people's property or discipline them properly. My heart breaks for my mom. I don't plan on having kids, but if you do, please teach them at an early age to respect other people and their things. Stalkers think they can scare me out of my new home. Cast, we've got me. We've got Entitled Stalkers 1 and 2. We've got The Kind Neighbor. I should give you guys just a little backstory on how I ended up in this situation. I grew up in Scientology. My parents joined back in 1991 and moved to the States to be involved more than they could from the UK. In 2015, when I was 15, I joined the Sea Org and signed a billion year contract. I know how insane that is, but it was something my parents were pressuring me to do because they thought it would allow me to be the best Scientologist I could be. But last August, I saw my opportunity to leave and I took it. I was sent out with a group of other Sea Org members to confront some people who had been declared as suppressive peoples who were outside the building. When one of them said that they had a permit to film some stuff in the street and since it was public that we couldn't stop them and that it was in the car parked about five minutes away from where we were. One of the women I had come out with me told me to go with the guy and check it out, so I did. When we got around the corner, I told the guy I wanted to leave, but hadn't been able to because there was always someone watching. He suggested that maybe since we were out of sight, maybe we could get into his car and he would drive me to a hotel and get me to a room so I could plan where I could go after a couple of days. So I took the opportunity and got into his car and finally felt so much freedom that I had never felt before. He also had been a Scientologist and had escaped the gold base years ago, so understood my situation very well. And once I figured out that I wanted to go to Washington, he got in contact with some friends of his who were able to get me there without Scientology having any way of tracing my movements. I have been here ever since. I live in a nice neighborhood, well, at least to where I had been before, and had managed to get a job working in a coffee shop. I've been so happy to be free, but I never fully stopped looking over my shoulder. I know the policies regarding people like me, and I've been keeping an eye out for them ever since I left. Two months ago, I noticed that a car with tinted windows was following me. I knew it was down to Scientology. They had somehow found out where I had moved and were trying to gather information on me. Last week, they finally knocked on my door. Even though I knew it was going to happen sooner or later, I was shaking. My neighbor, who has always been really kind to me, was over. She comes over sometimes just to check on me and she'll bring me food if she feels like I haven't eaten properly. She's basically been like a mom to me and I love her for it. I opened the door and things got really uncomfortable really fast. Stalker 1 Your parents have been worried about you. 
and you're hiding out here. Why? Me. I'm not hiding. I just don't want to be in a cult anymore. Stalker 1, shouting. Liar! You are a criminal. You broke your contract and you fled. You are evil. Kind neighbor interrupts. Hold on a minute. Stop shouting. OP is not evil and she is free to live her life as she pleases. Now leave her property or I will call the police. Stalker 2, holding a camera pointed at my face. You are a suppressive person. You may not set foot in any Scientology building again. If you do, we will have you charged for harassment. I'm confused. But you're the ones who tracked me down. I know the policies. I know I'm a SP. I know about being disconnected with my family. So what do either of us gain from you being here? Kind neighbor. Put the camera down. Stalker 1. No. Kind neighbor closes the door in their faces and goes to close the curtains as I told her that they would probably try filming through my windows. I went and closed all the other curtains in my home and after kind neighbor left, I locked my doors too. They're still watching my house from a car across the street and I feel uncomfortable about going outside. I know what kind of methods they can use when they are fair gaming and SP. I know now after watching Going Clear and Leia Ramini's show that my experience with them after leaving is tame but it's still pretty creepy. Why they feel entitled to follow people around to a point where I'm basically a prisoner in my own home, I don't know. But I wish they would leave me alone. I'm not sure what information they have gathered on me, but I know whatever it is will have been sent back and it will be used against me in some way. But until they try and use it, I have no way to really do anything. If anyone has any advice, please let me know. Am I the jerk for not entering my team's time into payroll, causing them to not get paid on time? I was promoted to supervisor last October. My team was extremely babied by their old boss. She did everything for them. They're all adults. I'm talking most of them have degrees in our past college age. This is an entry level position, but I've been trying to make them more self-sufficient and prepare them to get promoted and be ready to take on more responsibility. One thing they do poorly that was always done for them is the old boss was always putting in their timesheets. Company handbook policy is that subordinates do their own timesheet and are 100% responsible for their own entry. Supervisors verify vacation time and overtime was coded correct. Some of my people did not know how to even enter their own time. It was that bad. I've spent countless hours training and coaching them how to put in their time. I have caught it many times where some of them have forgot to enter their time and just before the deadline for payroll to run, I was able to enter their time to get them paid followed by coaching and a verbal reminder to do it next time. I have a pop-up calendar reminder that goes out every Friday to remind them to both their work and personal emails to enter their time at the end of the day, which includes a link with instructions on how to enter the time. Both instructions and our payroll can be accessible internally and externally off of the company network. I finally had enough and verbally told my team in a team meeting that the next time someone forgets to enter their time, I will not enter for them. Keep in mind that our payroll system allows for pre-entry of time for up to four months, so they can't enter their straight time, holiday pay, planned vacation pay in the system ahead of time. This last pay period, I had half my team forget, yet again, and they didn't get paid. They can enter their time, but won't get their pay until the following paycheck. They are all threatening to quit, which I don't really care, because we are overstaffed anyway and could fill the positions easily. So, after almost one year of coaching and warning, not to mention weekly email reminders, I made good on my thread because they can't get their crap together. Am I the jerk? Since it's aged 23 years, it means it's $23, right? So today, I served a jerk. But rather than him getting away with it, justice was rightfully served. He was already being a jerk right when he walked in and radiated entitled energy, and I unfortunately had to serve him tonight. He ordered a specific cognac with coke, but we didn't have the one that he wanted, so I asked him if he wanted to substitute it. He asked me what I recommended or what whiskeys I like to drink. I started to list off a few and I jokingly said, Pappy Van Winkles, and said, just kidding, that's really expensive. Admittedly, I was wrong for adding that last part at the end and I can see why he got offended. I didn't insinuate anything with that comment. I was just trying to make a joke by listing the most expensive liquor we have on the menu. With that being said, me saying that really struck a nerve with him and he said that I offended him 
and assumed that he didn't have a big enough pocket for it, so he ordered the Pappy Van Winkle. I asked him if he's sure, and he said yes. Okay, bed. So I asked him which one he wanted and pointed at both the years we have and the price of each one. I made it a point to not say the price because I really didn't want to offend him again. After all, he has big enough pockets to pay for it, am I right? He ordered the 23 year, mind you, it cost $150 for a glass, and I told him, are you sure? It's the most expensive liquor we have on the menu. He told me, yes, money isn't a problem. Go ahead and place the order. So I sure as heck placed the order for the 23 year old Pappy Van Winkle. I dropped off his drink and he proceeded to ask, since it's aged 23 years, it costs $23, right? I replied, no, you ordered the most expensive scotch on our menu and it cost $150. He did not take this prize lightly. He was in utter disbelief that a glass of scotch would cost this much. He said shame on me for ringing it in and asked me why I didn't tell him the cost up front. Hmm, maybe if you didn't boast about how much money isn't an issue for you, I would have spoken up. Maybe if you didn't radiate so much little jerk energy, I wouldn't have rang you up. I don't mind taking the heat from an upset table, but not only did he harass me and bug me about the price the whole night, he was harassing every server, every manager, and every table within his vicinity about how much his drink had cost. This isn't a flex. You are absolutely making a complete fool of yourself. No one's impressed by your poor decision-making skills, but go off, I guess. By the time the bill arrived, he tried to talk himself out of his drink. He wanted it removed from the bill. He wanted his whole bill comped for his inconvenience. But thankfully, I have amazing managers, and they made him pay the full tab. The best part of the night wasn't him leaving, but the fact that he had his girlfriend pay for the tab. Money isn't a thing for him, because his girlfriend covers his broke self. Boss insists equipment go to a mechanic to save costs. Ends up costing him $1,000 more. Context. I'm a new supervisor in property maintenance, and the riding lawnmower we have has often broken down. A lot of these problems are from years of not doing preventative maintenance on it, which is something I've started doing recently in order to have the machine working better, for longer, and cutting down on downtime and mechanic costs. I've been spending almost all of my free time researching this mower, so I know what's wrong when something is wrong and will be able to tell the difference between a 30-minute $40 repair I can do or a 3-day $600 repair the mechanic needs to do. A few weeks ago, while I was in the middle of starting a maintenance log on the mower, my boss sees me and asks, Is that thing broken down again? To which I reply, No, I'm just trying to make sure that it doesn't break down again. This is when he lets me know that he thinks what I'm doing is a waste of time and money because our biggest expense is labor. So he no longer wants me to work on the mower and instead wants me to take it to the mechanic across the city that charges $110 an hour for labor. The next week, of course, the mower breaks down again. I tell my boss that I think the problem is likely the air filter and he just tells me to take it to the mechanic. Me and the whole crew spend 45 minutes driving across the city to the mechanic drop off the mower, and sure enough, they had to replace the air filter and it took them an entire day. They also told me that they had looked the whole thing over and found no other issues and charged us a few hundred dollars. Two days after getting the mower back from the mechanic and it began having the issues again. I knew it wasn't the air filter, but the fuel filter looked extremely dirty. Once again, I told my boss and he told me, take it to the mechanic. Back we go. I tell the mechanics that the fuel filter looks bad and describe the issues I'm having. They say it's probably the fuel pump module, so they replace that and don't touch the fuel filters. This is another three hours of labor they charge us, plus parts and the problem still isn't fixed. We get the mower back from them and once again it breaks down on someone's front lawn. I call the mechanic, he acts confused, then asks us to bring it back for them to work on it more. This time they keep it for three days. I told them something was wrong with the fuel filter and they insisted it must be the fuel pump and took the whole fuel system apart just for them to agree with me that the problem was the fuel filter. Essentially, because my boss insisted that whenever there is a problem with the riding mower, we take it to the mechanic even if I can fix it, it cost us nearly a full week of lost work plus over $1,000 in mechanic costs when I could have had it back up and running within 2 hours and for under $100. Am I the jerk for telling mom? 
No apology, no wedding invitation. After seeing the wedding gift she gave my fiancé, I, female 25, am getting married to my fiancé, Kevin, next month. My family loves Kevin and Kevin loves them. However, my mom is the brutally honest type who constantly dishes out her opinions and thoughts on what people wear, how they look, how well off they are. Mostly negative, tasteless, backhanded comments. She says she can't help it and that no one should be offended when she's just being honest. When she met Kevin, she kept making comments about him, his car, his degree, etc. With time and strict conversations, I was able to get her to show some respect, but she kept annoying Kevin by constantly talking about his hairless face. His face is clean shaven. He doesn't have a beard or a mustache, which he can be very insecure about. He comes from Irish origins, so he's white. He has no facial hair while I'm Hispanic. Mom made jokes with her husband about how unmanly it is to not be able to grow a beard or a mustache. These comments hurt Kevin so much. I had a very stern conversation with her and she said, Oh, I didn't realize those remarks were offending him. I was just teasing him. Or, you know me, I'm just giving my humble, honest opinion, so he shouldn't take it personal and should learn that this is how I am. She ended up sincerely apologizing to Kevin and we left it at that. As the wedding is approaching, mom decided to give Kevin a wedding gift and also to let him know how sorry she was for her past behavior. She invited the whole family for dinner and decided it was the perfect time to hand Kevin his wedding gift. He thanked her, but she insisted that he open it up right then and there and show everyone what she got him, since she knew him that well already. He opened the box and he found a set of shaving tools with shaving cream. Kevin stopped for a second and kept staring at the gift. My stepdad took it and showed everyone. Then mom and others started laughing while stepdad kept saying, You get the joke, Kev? You get the joke? And my brother running around the table laughing with everyone. Kevin got up and walked out. I was so mad, I lost it on mom, asking why she did that and humiliated Kevin in front of everyone. She told me to relax. She was just messing with him, but I said she knew how he felt about this topic and demanded she apologize but she said no since she wasn't responsible for his reaction and thought he was going to laugh along. I angrily said, no apology, no wedding invitation, period, then walked out. She freaked out, calling, trying to say that we overreacted to a joke, and my brother said I was crazy to exclude mom from my wedding over something so stupid. He said Kevin should get over it since it was a joke, but I refused to send an invitation and withheld until slash unless she apologizes. They think I'm being unreasonable choosing this to be my hill to die on and called me disrespectful for how I treated my mom. I'd like to point out that my brother and stepdad and uncle sometimes take part in teasing Kevin. My brother, who's 31 years old, would sometimes either brag about his goatee mustache in front of Kevin or tell an indirect silly joke about the topic, which would irritate Kevin and just spoil any family gatherings we have. But mom is the one who started this whole campaign and I've already had conversations with her about it. Kevin is American, but has Irish origins. Customer using manager as his own personal shopper. I work at a mid-sized convenience store, and let me be clear, we do not offer personal shoppers. I work at the till and notice my manager running around fetching items for a middle-aged gentleman with a trolley. In between customers, I quietly joked to my manager, you should get paid to be a personal shopper. And my manager responded, it's not as if I have work to do. Needless to say, I was not looking forward to serving the guy and I was quietly hoping he would go to the self-service machines. Nope. He started putting the items on the table one at a time. He was sorting the items and put some of them far away from me and some of them closer to me. He found out he was missing scones and asked, Where's the scones? I politely said to him, They're by the bakery aisle. I thought he would go get it himself but he yelled at my manager to grab the scones for him. My manager politely obliged. There was a long queue and I started to scan items as he put them on the table. I had finished with the closer items and started to scan the items he placed farther to me. However, he was not pleased with this and yelled, Stop! Scan the frozen items first! Okay, I replied. This caused a lot of delays as I had to wait for him to put the frozen items and had to stop scanning while he messed around his trolley getting the frozen items. All the time he was complaining about being a slave to the missus 
and this was not his first time shopping. He also said, you wouldn't understand since you're not married. I politely suggested that he use our online click and collect service if he wanted someone to do the shopping for him. I also suggested he use our competitor store delivery service. At that point, I didn't care if we lost him as a customer, but it's a small price to pay if it meant my colleagues didn't have to deal with him. He couldn't hear me over the noise of the store. The mask muffled my voice a little. He asked me to speak up and speak slower. I just nodded and pretended to listen to his moans. It was a noisy store and I could only hear half of his complaints. He paid and said, I will make sure you have not double charged me. He spent the next three minutes blocking that cash register, checking the long receipt. While he was doing that, I said, while you're checking, let me serve the next customer. I gladly left him to his own devices and went to cash register one to serve the other customers. He was finally happy and said, you did all right, before leaving. Neighbors that constantly ask for help. We bought a house in April and the neighbors across the street from us are in the process of moving out. They have a huge house, six bedrooms, five bathrooms that was top of the line 25 years ago. It was listed for 600K about six weeks ago. They took forever to pack, has been pending three times and is now at 500K. So I'm assuming an inspector is finding an issue. Other houses in my neighborhood that are not that size are selling. They asked us to help change light bulbs and fix little things, which was perfectly fine. However, they've started sending requests, pointing their frame of the screen patio, replacing faucets, cleaning their house. We painted their screened in patio because we thought, mistake, it was the last thing they had asked. And we honestly felt bad because the house is in need of some major TLC. It's got original carpet that has been cleaned and stretched so many times that it is desperately in need of being ripped out. The bathroom tubs are peeling. The house was freshly painted, but was terribly done. When they put it up for sale, they left some huge furniture that they requested us to sell, and we could keep 10% of the profits, and acted like this was a huge reward. It's a 20-year-old couch, mattresses, three dressers, and other outdated furniture that is worth nothing, and weighs a ton, and is upstairs. So obviously it didn't sell for anything, and is still sitting upstairs in their house. One person came for a dresser and it was too heavy for us to move, so we figured this is all custom built and assembled in the room. When they left, they requested us to do daily walkthroughs and send daily reports of their house, which is fine, but we stopped after a week because we have our own house that we are working on, work, and are not trying to spend weekends and time off at someone else's house when we literally bought a house to spend time here. We both get up at 4 a.m. for work, get home around 4.30 p.m., eat, and sometimes we'll literally nap the majority of the rest of the day. Yesterday was one of those days. Little did I know these neighbors were back in town, had called each of us several times after 7 p.m. Once we got off work, we don't look at our phones, texted us multiple times, with which we gave polite replies, but said we weren't able to help them. We wind down for the day around 7 p.m. because we get up at 4 a.m., they knocked on our door at 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m., and 11 p.m. according to our ring camera. If you had a problem, you wouldn't be going to just my house. This is starting to feel like an am I the jerk post, but I really want to just tell these people that we cannot help them anymore and this is not my problem. This post doesn't go into detail of everything we have done for them, but it quickly became too much. Every time we leave their house after doing things, my significant other and I both feel so bad because it needs so much work. It's so dirty and with three people walking, there has got to be some major issue as I notice they go back on the market after an inspection is there. Basically, this is a vent post. Am I overreacting? How would you handle this? Edit. We reviewed the ring cam footage. Looks like the woman tried to open our door. Like, who does that? Were you just going to walk in and look for us? Is it a culture thing that I'm missing? I'm not exactly the type that would confront and be all upset and stuff, but that's ridiculous. I got to scare a thief. I used to work as a retail supervisor for a hospital hotel for years. I got a lot of stories during that time, but this one is one of my favorites. The first time we see the person in question, he was grabbing a tray and heading over to the soup bar. I remember distinctly that he was wearing a very bright, memorable Hawaiian shirt. I was working the register, so I had a pretty good vantage point of most of the area customers would be, which makes it easier to keep an eye on everyone and everything. The man came up with his tray of soup, staring straight ahead. 
Worried he would pass me and forget to pay, I said in my winning customer service voice, Hello, sir. He kept walking. Sir, you have to pay for that. Still no response, and he didn't even speed up his walk. Sir, sir. Being a woman on the short side, there was no way for me to stop him, so I picked up the phone and dialed security. The man decided to walk out into our courtyard, which just so happened to not double as an exit. Security came to me, asked me about what had happened, then went to go talk to the individual. He ended up being escorted off the premises, and we thought that was that. Just a very bold thief. But no, it couldn't stop there. It was a slow day, so hours later I was chatting with a coworker. Me behind my counter, my coworker on the other side. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a very familiar Hawaiian shirt. The thief had returned. Now, for me personally, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt, so I didn't say anything at first, but I did keep half an eye on him while I chatted with my work friend. On the complete other side of the room from where I was, trust me, huge room, I saw the man pick up a bag of chips and stuff them in his shirt. I was pretty ticked off, so before I could think, hesitate, or finish the sentence I was on in my conversation, big sister voice came out, and I yelled in a voice that is often used to frighten bigger people than me, Sir! Put those chips back right now. My coworker was frozen in place with surprise and confusion, and the man's eyes were huge. There was silence for a few moments as I did my best to keep up the stern expression I had. He walked over to me, and it was suddenly very obvious how much smaller I was. Without saying a word, he took the chips out of his shirt, laid them down on the counter in front of me, and trudged away. For years after that, it was my coworker's favorite story of me, and one I tend to chuckle at now. Artist's sister-in-law wants my husband and I to support her instead of getting a real job. My husband, 39 male, and I, 37 female, have been married for 8 years and we have 2 kids. He and his sister, my sister-in-law, who's 31, have always been close despite the age difference. There's also a brother in between who isn't relevant to this post. Sister-in-law is an artist who has been working full-time on her art since graduating from school several years ago. I respect art and believe it can absolutely be someone's full-time job, but the fact is that she's never made any money off of her art aside from selling the occasional piece to a family friend. I don't want to pass judgment on her art because I'm no expert, a STEM person here, but she's been trying to make it for years and years at this point and hasn't gained any traction. I don't think she's going to start making money off of it anytime soon. Still, she considers her art her career and my husband is supportive and proud of her. We own multiple pieces of hers. Her parents were fully supporting her financially until a couple of years ago when she moved in with her boyfriend who took over. She and the boyfriend broke up earlier this year and she moved into a nice apartment funded by her parents. Unfortunately, my in-laws recently passed suddenly and unexpectedly. It was devastating. What they left behind will support sister-in-law for a while, but not forever and not in the standard of living she's accustomed to, which includes having to move out of her current apartment. Husband told me he wanted to give her money every month so that she can keep working full-time on her art and maintain her standard of living. We both fortunately have high-paying jobs and a lot already saved for our kids, so we could easily afford it. However, I don't like the idea of supporting a non-disabled adult forever who could make her own living but chooses not to. I'm okay with helping her out temporarily while she starts working and figures out how to make her own living, but not forever. I don't care if she starts out at minimum wage, she just has to be doing something that will make money and start her path to independence. I did slip up and call it a real job to my husband. She and husband are both telling me that I'm the jerk because if she has to work full time, she won't have time anymore for her art and that being an artist is a real job already. He says I don't understand the sibling bond since I'm an only child. His other brother agrees with me and says it would be about time sister-in-law got out into the real world. Am I the jerk? Edit. Sister-in-law has submitted to work to many galleries, tried to sell her art online via social media, etc. She's tried to sell to a larger audience than family friends and family members but hasn't gotten any bites, so her not selling her work widely isn't for lack of trying, unfortunately. I'm not sure if it's because she's not great at promotion or because the market doesn't want what she's selling. What would you do in this situation? Would you support sister-in-law or not? Please let us know. I'd help her get some career coaching. Loving art and being great at it doesn't guarantee you can make money. Need to get business savvy, bruh.
My friends can't pay for Uber and are furious my mom is driving us to the concert tomorrow. I'm supposed to be going to a concert tomorrow, August 25th, with three of my friends. There are four bands total. The three of them are flying out here. It's an hour-long flight, and I was supposed to pick them up from the airport, take them to a cheap diner, and then to the concert. Well, today my car battery is completely dead and won't start with a jump. It's been having other mechanical issues and will be going to the shop tomorrow afternoon. So now, my mom will be taking us and picking us up. There is no public transport around here, so that's out, and the Ubers are ridiculously expensive. Between the four of us, we don't have that much money. Barely enough for food, let alone Ubers. Those concert tickets were $250 a pop. The concert venue is also two hours away from my house. Their flight gets in tomorrow at 3 p.m. My mom is picking them up from the airport after work around 6 p.m. She works about an hour away from the concert venue, which they are furious about since the gates open at 4.30 p.m. and we were originally planning on being there by 5. Also, no dinner for them. They will have to either eat before they go to the airport or eat the expensive airport food. We will be at the venue by 7 p.m. The first band comes on at 6. The one band we all really wanted to see comes on at 9. This concert is supposed to go on until 1 a.m. My mom said we need to be out front in the parking lot by 10. She refuses to pick us up any later because she has to work the next day. She said if I keep asking, then we can forget about going all together. We're lucky she's even considering taking us to begin with. She also said if we aren't out front by 10 p.m., then we're walking back home. She's not playing any games. I told my friends that we have to leave by 10 and they are upset, which is understandable because I'm not happy either. We will only be there from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. instead of 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. like originally planned. But it is what it is. I don't really see the point in going anymore. Then the next day, they have to sit in the airport for a few hours until their flight leaves because my mom is dropping them off at 7 a.m. since she has to be at work by 8. Their flight out isn't until 10 a.m. My friends are upset. They said since my car broke down, I can pay for their Ubers. I can't pay for their Ubers and my mom thinks they're being ridiculous. They can either take my mom's offer on a ride or they can pay for Ubers themselves. They said they can't afford the Ubers and it's not fair for them to pay for the Ubers. They also said since they have to eat airport food, I can also pay for that too. There are food vendors at the venue or you can eat before you go. You can also eat at my house after the concert. They don't want to do that. They also don't want to sit at the airport for hours. I said I'm doing the best I can. At this point, if we don't go, then we all eat the cost of the concert tickets and they eat the cost of the flights. I don't know what else to do. I don't have that much extra spending money and my mom isn't paying for Ubers or anybody's food. I suggested we don't go anymore because it doesn't seem like it would be worth it and it's becoming a pain in the butt. All three are having tantrums. They're mad I invited them to go, mad I'm wasting their money. They still want to go, but nothing I suggest is good enough. They want me to pay for their food, Ubers, because it's inconveniencing them. They're calling me a flake and mean names that I'd rather not list. Said they were all excited and I got their hopes up for nothing. I should feel really bad for what I did and that I ruined their week. Just all this crap. I wasn't planning on my car breaking down, but it is what it is. I don't know what else to do at this point. I'm not really happy about wasting $250 on a ticket if we don't go. I mean... We can either go and be there from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. or we eat the cost of concert slash plane tickets and stay at home. Update. Per several suggestions on my last post, I should ask my friends to pitch in for the Ubers or the cost of a new battery. The cost for a new battery from AAA is about $160. I don't have $160 to spare on a new battery myself. So I suggested to my three friends that we split the cost. They can each Venmo me the money so we can go to the concert tonight. 160 divided by four would be $40 each. My friends said they aren't going to spend their food money on my car battery and then starve the whole time. They were only planning on bringing 40 to $50 each for food and that's it. They said they don't have any more money to bring and their parents won't give them money. They also don't want to risk getting stuck on the side of the road because my car has mechanical issues that I need to pay for an Uber to pick them up from the airport and drive them to the concert venue and back to my house after. It's $136 one way from airport to concert. 
from the venue to my house, it's 95. They refuse to pay for their own Uber because they can't afford it and I'm the one inconveniencing them, so I should pay. They're still pretty mad and still calling me every name under the sun, sending texts in all caps, swearing and all, screaming and hanging up on phone calls when I try to talk to them over the phone. Because they spent $250 on a single concert ticket, so did I, and $80 each on round trip flights and they think I should pay for their food and Ubers since our original plan failed. It's a huge inconvenience to them since they are the ones flying out here. I said, if I get a new car battery, then we can go out to a cheap diner and stay at the concert as long as we want. We can stick to our original plans. They don't want to do that. They said it's not their car battery, so they aren't willing to help pay for it. It's my problem to deal with, and they've already spent enough money. They said if I was a good friend, I would be more than willing to pay for them because I haven't spent nearly as much as them. I don't have that much extra spending money myself right now, so if they don't want to do that, then my mom can drive us like suggested in my last post, or we don't go at all. Uber is out of the question. It's too expensive and we can't afford it. My mom is already at work right now, so her renting a car is out of the question. I asked before she left, and she said she's not going through all that just so we can all go to a stupid concert. We can take her offer or not go at all. Update 2. I sent those three girls, we are all girls, I don't know why people thought we were guys, but I sent them the same message before I blocked them. I said, I don't appreciate being called every name under the sun because my car broke down. You don't think I'm upset about it either? I tried being accommodating considering this is so last minute and nothing I suggested was good enough for any of you. So guess what? I'm done. Forget it. I'm no longer interested in going. If you three still want to fly out here, then you can have fun finding your own rides. It is no longer my problem. I don't care if you think I'm being a jerk. I think you're all being selfish and really immature. You showed me your true colors and now I'm going to show you mine. I then blocked them on social media and I blocked their numbers. I'm so irritated with them right now. I know what I said was pretty crappy, but I'm so over this whole situation. I am beyond annoyed right now. Also, there are so many tickets up for resale right now. I did list mine, but there's no bites. So I might just have to eat the $250, which I'm not happy about, but it is what it is. I don't think I would have had fun going to the concert by myself. If I did go, I would only be there for three hours anyways, because my mom would still have to drop me off and pick me up. It's just not worth it to me. I am upset plans fell through, and I don't get to see the concert, but this isn't the last time these bands will be touring either. Crap happens, unfortunately. My mom is willing to pay for a new car battery, but she wants me to be home when AAA is here. She wants me to deal with them, so I won't be getting a new battery today. Update 3. I got sent a bunch of videos and pictures from a random number of all the bands along with selfies of all three of them at the concert and pictures of them eating filet mignon at some upscale restaurant. Funny how earlier today none of them had more than $40 to pitch in. It appears they have way more than what they each told me by the videos and pictures that I was sent. They somehow managed to make it from the airport to the concert and it appears they also have a hotel room. It's just the three of them. Funny how they didn't like any of my previous suggestions of how to get to the concert, it wasn't good enough. I was expected to pay for their Ubers and food because I was inconveniencing them because my car battery died and is having mechanical issues. So I told them off and blocked them. I decided to stay home because I don't have a running car and didn't want to go to the concert by myself. My mom also didn't want to drop me off by myself. She didn't think it would be safe. I wasn't able to sell the $250 ticket either. I lowered the price to $150 but still no bites, so I ate the cost of that. It's now 9.45 PM. The concert is still going on as I type this, but I've been at home and just got sent texts from a random number with all that. Spam texts. Whoever is behind that also told me to go forget myself. I'm the worst friend on the planet. They're having a way better time without my cheap self. I don't deserve any friends after how I treated them amongst other insults. I didn't respond back, I just blocked the number. But yeah, I'm pretty irritated right now. It is what it is, I'm definitely not happy, but I don't even know what to say anymore. Bruh. Entitled mom on the plane thinks her son needs to look out of my window, even if it hurts me.
This happened a few years ago on a transatlantic flight, seven hours or so. I had a window seat and entitled mom sat down next to me with her son, who was maybe around five. She seemed nice enough and the kid was eating a box of animal crackers. Man, I totally should have bought some animal crackers before boarding. Anyway, after she had settled her things, she said to me, He'd really like to look out the window. Would you mind switching? She was more or less polite, but I could sense the undercurrent of entitlement, and I was just not in the mood for it. Being polite, but firm myself, I responded. I'd prefer to stay in my seat. Also, it's an overnight flight. I gestured outside. It's dark out. She shifted from politely waiting for me to do her bidding and escalated to the Karen glare. Just switch with him. He wants to look outside. So, you want me to sit between you? What? No. He'll take the window while you take the aisle. Her expression added. Obviously. Jeez. How clueless can you be? I stared at her, wondering what the heck was wrong with her. Entitled mom stared back, clearly wondering what the heck was wrong with me. And you might also be wondering what the heck was wrong with me. Why didn't I just switch, right? Well, you see, what isn't obvious to you, but was plainly obvious to Entitled Mom, was that my arm was in a sling. If I moved to the aisle seat, per her demands, that arm would be in the aisle, fully available for bodies and beverage carts to bump it throughout the long flight. Just sitting next to someone was a calculated risk, but since it wasn't like I could afford to book an empty seat just to baby my limit of a shoulder, it was the lesser of two evils, one seatmate versus an entire flight's worth of traffic. When it became clear that Entitled Mom wasn't going to make the connection without some guidance, I pointed emphatically at my sling. I messed up my shoulder a few days ago and it really hurts. I don't want people bumping into it. The Karen Claire intensifies. People aren't going to bump into it if you're not leaning out of your seat into the aisle. Please just let him look out of the window. She did say please, but she was basically speaking in the Karen voice at this point, so the please was doing as much heavy lifting as it would if she were saying, please go get your manager so I can have you fired. I'd basically had enough at this point, so I just took a muscle relaxer, put on my headphones, and knocked out for the long flight, because forget her. When we landed in London, the kid was out cold, and entitled mom looked like she was on the verge of hallucinating from lack of sleep though she still mustered enough energy to shoot me the tired Karen glare. I think she legitimately spent the entire flight fuming that I wouldn't let her, now sleeping, son look out of the window at the darkness. I seriously considered telling her I'd done her a favor. After all, if he had spent that long looking into the void, the void would have eventually begun looking into him. That may have been the muscle relaxers talking. I certainly don't want to harass a customer. So, I finally have a story to post here. I work in health, IT. Specifically, I assist people with getting into various patient portals to access their health information, make appointments, message doctors, etc. 95% of the people who call us are nice and often grateful when we're able to help them get back into their portal. Some start as frustrated, but once they see we're able to help them and get them what they need, they transform and become as sweet as pudding pie. Then there's the other 5%. Oh boy. A note here that the company I work for is excellent. They put an emphasis on customer service first, but also have our back if there are any genuine issues with a customer misbehaving. Everything is recorded, so if there are any questions, quality assurance or management can go back, hear for themselves, and make recommendations as needed. All this leads to our caller for today. Mr. Jerk was having problems getting into his portal. He calls me, literally yelling about how broken and garbage your system is, with a tone implying I personally picked the EHR and portal for a medical organization in another state just to spite him. Hey, no hurt feelings here. There are some things I don't like about the portal either, but he continues on and on about how much he hates it. All his friends hate it, his neighbors hate it, his pets hate it, and so on. When I can finally get a polite word in, I ask him for his name so I can look him up in our system. He spits out his name. Bob Jerk. Per HIPAA, I also have to ask for two secondary identifiers to make sure he is the right Bob Jerk. I ask for his date of birth and the last four of his social per procedure. He rants about why can't I get him back into his chart now and screeches out the rest of his info. I try to find him in the system as he continues babbling angrily 
and lo and behold, he's not in there. I politely ask him to spell his name. Jeez, don't you know how to do your job? Turns out his name is not spelled like the normal jerk. It's spelled a little bit differently. I finally find him and open his file. So, you can't get into the portal, sir? Yes, didn't I just say that? Okay, sir, I see your username is jerknozzle86. I can't look up old passwords, so would you like me to give you a temporary one? Screaming intensifies. I'm already in my portal, he cries in fury, completely contradicting what he said mere seconds ago. I need help finding my information. I'm now holding my headset away from my ear in pain. If my cubicle neighbor had not been at lunch, I'm pretty sure he'd be able to hear this guy just as clearly as me. I'm sorry, sir. I thought you just said, Don't you even know what you're doing? Well, sir, what are you... Why do you keep asking me these questions? You're harassing me. Oh, well now, I can't be harassing my customers. That's just not appropriate and against our company's policies, of course. Deep breath, clear voice. Well, sir, I'm trying to assist you, but if you feel I'm harassing you, then I'm afraid I need to end this call. The screaming had become intelligible at this point, though I hear a couple of curse words thrown in there. Remember how I said our company has our back? If this kind of language is used, we're allowed to disconnect after a warning and I had already told him I was going to end this call. I'm sorry I wasn't able to help you, sir. Thank you for calling Patient Portal. Have a good day. Push end call. Per procedure, I immediately notified Quality Assurance of what had just happened in case the guy called back with complaints or started bellowing at other agents. Quality Assurance listens to the call and comes back with, Wow, that guy started angry and he never let up. You tried to help and you had more patience than I would have. You're fine. I went on to help many other lovely customers through the rest of the day. He thankfully never called back. I would not be surprised to find out he had filled himself with so much rage that he spontaneously combusted, leaving a vacuum of bitterness behind in his place. Am I the jerk? Told my boss I'm not required to answer my phone 24-7 and now he's salty. I, 37 male, work in a department where I'm the sole expert for our equipment. If an issue comes up and the shift crew can't figure it out, I'm the first one they try to contact. I'm happy to help since I'm friends with all of our guys, but these calls can come at late night or early morning and my schedule is 7am to 4pm. When I got the job, the only stipulation was that they would not be able to contact me for stuff like scheduling issues, shift coverage, or other issues, but it did not mention anything about after hours on call. Outside of my normal hours, I don't give a hoot about the plant. I'll usually answer calls out of my own goodwill as long as it doesn't happen all the time. However, my sleep time is sacred. If I'm woken up, it will take me at least an hour to fall back to sleep if I'm lucky. My phone started going off at around 1 a.m. and went off a few more times before my wife gave me a swift kick, telling me to shut it off or answer it. I call back and it's our shift technician, Clayton. He apologized for waking me up, but they've been dealing with an issue for hours, so I help him out and it took all of five minutes. After hanging up, I ended up lying there in bed for another two hours before falling back asleep. That morning, my supervisor, John, has me meet him in his office and this is how the conversation goes. John, it seems we had an eventful night. Clayton had to get a hold of me. You didn't answer his call? Me, around 1 a.m.? I was asleep and the phone didn't wake me. John, well, he called me and I wasn't able to do much for him, so I had him call you back. Told him you were probably hard to wake up and to keep calling. Me, a little upset now. Well, I'm always happy to help the guys, but they can't rely on me to always be available. I usually keep my phone in the kitchen, but I just happened to have left it on my nightstand last night. John. Well, this isn't exactly the first time they've had trouble reaching you. Me, a bit more agitated. Most likely because my phone was in the kitchen. I don't keep it on me 24-7. You're required to have a phone on you. Me, ticked off. Okay, nowhere in the policy does it dictate that I am to keep on a phone on me at all times, nor does my job description. I'm only required to have a method for you to contact me if we have a scheduling change or some other issues that deal directly with my ability to get to work. If you wish for me to be on call, then perhaps we need to discuss promoting me to a position that requires me to be on call. But I am happy with my current arrangement. If you feel differently, then maybe we need to invite HR to join our conversation. 
that's where things ended. I'm well aware that I could suffer some consequences for this, but I feel that this is an overstep on their part. I do have a good working relationship with everyone, but when he said that, I pretty much snapped at him and now I'm feeling like a jerk. So, am I the jerk? ETA. Well, this got way more of a response than I imagined. 1. So I've been keeping notes and saving all communications over the years and have backups of all call logs and text transcripts. This was done just to keep myself covered, but now I see that it will come in use. I have a meeting with the head of HR tomorrow and my plan is to lay enough info to show a pattern of what's going on. 2. On the recommendation of another Redditor, I did send an email to my boss asking him to confirm that I'm expected to keep my phone on me at all times, and he responded, affirmative. Well, that's part of the info package. 3. While they do not pay for my phone, there have been insinuations made by supervisors that since the company provides a corporate discount through the carrier I use, that it justifies them asking us to be available. I don't even use this discount because we can't stack it with other discounts. I have a family plan, and since my mother is on it, we get to use the discount that the county she works for provides, and it's a better discount. Anyway, I will provide an update once things shake out. Thanks everyone. Getting sent home for doing what I was told to do, then in trouble for going home. Years and years ago, I was working for a fast food restaurant. I was a crew trainer, and part of the crew trainer training was watching some videos talking about your responsibility. One of those responsibilities was called coaching. If you see someone, even a manager, that actually said those words on the video, doing something incorrectly, you were to coach them on the correct procedures. I'm sure you can see where this is going. So flash forward some time and I was working with a manager nobody liked. I witnessed the manager do something wrong. Specifically, she poured out two medium fries to make a large fry to give to a customer. That was a big no-no. You were never supposed to take an already packaged item and use it to make a smaller or larger package. So, cue malicious compliance. And next time I saw the manager, I simply said to her that what she did was wrong and that she should have waited for fresh fries to finish cooking. Well, she looked at me and said that I am a manager and I don't have to follow the rules. Go and clock out now and go home. So I did. I went and punched out, grabbed my jacket and started walking out of the store. She came up behind me and said, I want to talk to you before you go. I turned and said, sorry, you had me clocked out. I'm no longer working and you can no longer keep me here to talk. You should have done this before I clocked out. And I walked out of the door. She tried to get me in trouble and fired, tried to claim that I walked off the job, tried to claim that she never told me to clock out. However, there were too many witnesses to the whole ordeal and she couldn't get her way. Too many of my friends I worked with told the store manager my story was 100% accurate and that she was lying. I have no idea why he kept her after this, but he did. I ended up quitting a few months later because she made my life heck every time I worked with her. Then later she got fired for trying to get the store manager fired. So in the end, she lost. No ma'am, you cannot demand we hire your son. A few years ago, I worked at a store that dealt in used electronics. It was mostly movies, games, and pop culture merch, but we also sold a wide variety of items like cameras and headphones. It was a very popular store due partly to the low prices and the fact that we generally paid more than our competitors for used goods but customers also liked the atmosphere. The staff was very close-knit and management encouraged a casual approach to customer service. So not only was it a cool place to shop, it seemed like a cool place to work, which it was. This meant that during all times of the year, we were flooded with applications. We actually had a new apps box behind the counter that had to be emptied for filing once a week because it would always fill up. As a retail establishment, we did have a moderate turnover but the store was small and only had 11 to 15 people employed there at any given time, so we only occasionally picked up new hires. This didn't stop people from applying, especially recent graduates who were hoping that the cool video game store would be their first job. I was working the front counter at the time entitled Mom Walked in the Door. This happened a while ago, so the conversation is of course paraphrased. She approached me and I smiled and greeted her. Me. Hi, how can I help you? Entitled Mom. Hi, can I speak to the manager? Me. Oh, of course, but he's currently in the office on a call. He was. Is there something I can help you with before he's available? My son turned in an application a month ago and he hasn't heard anything back. 
Me, apologetic. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. We get a lot of applications, to the point where our employment manager can't call people back if they aren't accepted for an interview. This should be mentioned on the application, but I'm sorry if your son wasn't told that. However, we keep applications on file for six months, so if a position opens up, we could still possibly consider him for employment. She huffed and rolled her eyes, giving me a sarcastic laugh. That's ridiculous! Are you guys prejudiced against hiring boys or something? I blinked at her. I was one of the two girls employed at this location, compared to 11 guys. Of the four people visible behind the counter, I was the only girl. Me. Ma'am, I'm one of the only girls that works here. Entitled Mom seemed to notice this and began to splutter a little because she was getting flustered. She continued laughing sarcastically through her sentences. So what? Are you prejudiced against hiring hard workers? I honestly didn't know what to say. I was trying not to laugh because it was such a weird response. Me. No, we just have a lot of applicants and the chances of getting picked are low. It's not personal. Uh, but if you'd still like to ask the manager about it, I can go see if he's finished on the phone. Entitled Mom, huffing, still laughing. No, never mind. This is just ridiculous. I'm taking my business to your competitor. She stomped away. After she left, my coworkers and I just looked at each other and started laughing. We chatted about it for a little while, and when the manager came back from the office, we told him about the encounter. He basically said what I said, that it was one application in a sea of many, and it wasn't personal. Honestly, if you come into a store and demand the manager to hire your kid, it's probably only going to hurt their chances. Nobody wants to deal with someone's crazy parent hovering around the business all the time. Speaking of cool stores, what's your favorite store of all time? Please let us know. Three words. Bed, bath, and beyond. Isn't that actually four? X is divorce lawyer. Send three years of complete financials or else. Me, as you wish. This happened several years ago when my ex and I were going through a heated divorce and custody battle. While we were married, we had a couple of conversations about how rich people hide their assets to avoid paying taxes. I've never had enough assets to do this, but she somehow got the idea that I was and told her attorney that I was laundering money and hiding income. It was more likely the heat of the moment as a divorce, custody battle often comes down to. I couldn't even afford my own attorney, so I represented myself. Her lawyer wasn't a total jerk, but he clearly was out to get me, and he talked down to me like I didn't deserve to breathe the same air. One day, I get a letter in the mail from him requesting an updated income declarations form and three years of financials. It had a long list of things to include. I own a communications tech company that was in super startup phase back then. Money was already tight. I was trying to get this business off the ground with no financing. I was finishing my MBA with scholarships and loans, so paying for copies and postage or driving this 30 miles to his office meant eating peanut butter and saltines for a week. So I called him to explain my situation. He all but called me a liar and didn't believe I couldn't afford it. I was put off by that and I said this was taking time away from business I needed to handle. To which he replied, and I'll never forget this. Well, according to your income declarations, you're not that busy. What do you do all day? He then said if I didn't get these documents, he would consider my previous filings as fraudulent, tell the judge, contact the DA, and also alert the state tax agency and IRS. Probably an empty threat, but I'm no lawyer. EFAX is one of the services my company provides, and at this time it was relatively unknown. So I asked him if he has a fax machine. He said he had a fax, scanner, and a copier device, then said what law office doesn't have a fax machine, and I suddenly got an idea. Okay, I said to him, I'll put together and fax whatever I can. Okay, jerk. You want three years of financials? You got it. I scanned to PDF every receipt I could find. McDonald's receipt from five years ago? Oh well, won't hurt to include it. CVS receipt. It's three miles long. Perfect. They got the $1 off toothpaste coupons too. I downloaded every bank statement, credit card statement, purchase orders from vendors, and every invoice I sent to clients. I printed to PDF the entire three-year accounting journal, monthly, quarterly, annual balance sheets, cash flow statements, P&Ls. Not only did I PDF three years of tax filings, but every single letter I received from the IRS and state tax agency, including the inserts advising me of my rights. It took a while, but I was a few days ahead of the deadline. 
I made a cover page, black background with white lettering. Wherever I could, I included separator pages in all caps and the biggest, boldest font that would fit on the page and landscape. Receipts, taxes, etc. I merged everything into a single 150 plus page compressed PDF and sent the document using my eFax system. Every hour or so, I received a status email saying the fax failed. Huh? That's weird. Well, they're getting this document. So I changed the system configuration to unlimited retries after failures to keep redialing until it went through. Weird. I was still getting status email failures. I'll delete the failure emails and keep the success one after it eventually goes through, I thought. Problem solved. Two days later, a lady from his office called and asked me to stop sending the fax. Their fax, scanner, printer, and copier had been printing non-stop. It kept getting paper jams, kept running out of ink, and they had to keep shutting it off and back on to print. I explained that her boss told me to send this by the deadline or else he would call the DA and IRS. Since I didn't want to call from the DA or the IRS, I would keep sending until I got a success confirmation. I suggested they just not print until my fax completes, but she didn't like that. She asked me to email the documents, and I told a little white lie that my email wouldn't allow an attachment that big, unless her boss in writing agreed to cancel the request or agreed to reimburse me for my costs to print and ship, I said I would continue to fax until they confirm they have received every page. She put me on hold and the attorney gets on the line. He said, forget sending the financials. I said that I would need this in writing, so I will keep sending the fax until he sent that to me. He asked me to stop faxing and he would send it in writing. And I said, send it in writing first and then I'll stop. Long moment of silence. Click. About 20 minutes later, I received an email from his assistant with an attached, signed letter in PDF that I no longer needed to provide financials. The letter then threatened to pursue sanctions in court or sue me for interfering with their business. Every time I saw him after that, the lawyer never brought up sanctions, lawsuits, criminal referrals, or financials again. Tell me to appeal the unfair grade you gave me? All right, professor. Many years ago, I was a student studying computer science in the Midwest. While most of my professors were okay, there was one that was notorious. Let's call him Dr. J. Dr. J was an old, lazy professor with a thick accent who had been teaching for the better part of 30 years and had fully embraced the typical semi-retired lifestyle of the tenured professor. Showing up to office hours? Maybe. Showing up to help in a lab? Once the whole semester. I estimated out of three and a half hours per week of lecture time, he was actually in the classroom for maybe half of it, and the time that he did spend in the classroom was a complete waste. He would just pass out packets at the beginning of class that contained numerous diagrams and handwritten notes that were indecipherable and meander around the class pointing at various parts to groups of people working on them and mumble incoherently about how to solve it. I think I never understood a word he said. He never followed his course syllabus or even answered emails. For anyone who's taken an engineering course, especially an upper level, this won't sound too crazy. But here's the kicker. He would fail regularly half the class for a required upper level computer architecture course. This is exceptionally rare and completely unfair for a class at this level, especially at a state school that isn't a research uni. Typically, the interlopers have been weeded out by junior year, so while the rest of the classes are by no means a cakewalk, if you put forth an honest effort to learn the material, you should be able to pass the class with flying colors. Not so with Dr. J. Failing a class at the level of this course would be devastating to your degree path since it was a required course. Dr. J was the only one to teach it and it was only taught in fall. But Dr. J couldn't be bothered, despite the class average for his exams being something like 2 out of 15. Not that scores mattered because you could get the same score as someone on all assignments and exams, but you'd fail the class for who knows why. Here's the malicious compliance. Lo and behold, I'm one of the 16 out of 31 students in the class that he failed that semester. And I failed having gotten very similar scores to a couple other students, but they passed. I went to Dr. J's office after the scores had been applied to our transcripts online to discuss the matter. Dr. J wouldn't have any of it. Doesn't matter that I had similar scores to other students that had passed. There's many ways I grade my students and you failed. If you don't like it, you're free to appeal the grade but you won't get it. 
The fact that the little jerk was sitting there in his chair trying to BS me upset me so much more that I decided right then and there to mess his stuff up. My school has a very well laid out and responsible grade appeal policy with many avenues towards getting the appeal approved. I knew that through some of the snide jokes they made, my other professors did not take kindly to Dr. J at all, so it wasn't just the students that strongly disliked him. Well, when you appeal a grade, the other professors in the department are the ones who get to decide whether or not you actually passed, given certain evidence. It's practically criminal what he gets away with, were the words of my faculty advisor. Now, my original plan was for me to just file an appeal and move on, because I knew I'd get it. But Dr. J had poked the bear, and now I was mad. So I reached out to everyone in the class, very easy since we were all on a Slack channel together, and set a meeting in a conference room in the library. I guess I underestimated how much everyone hated Dr. J, because everyone from the class showed up. I laid out my plan. Everyone file a great appeal, even if you passed, if it'll help your GPA. At my school, a grade appeal will replace your letter grade with a satisfactory, which means you get credit for the course without a grade that affects your GPA. I had enough appeal forms pre-printed before the meeting so that everyone could fill it out together. It was the happiest I'd ever seen that group of people the entire semester. I think the final count of appeals was something like 22. Everyone whose GPA could be improved with a satisfactory applied for one. You should have seen the look on the department chair's face when we showed up with a stack of appeals. No department in the history of this school had ever had that many appeals and complaints for a single course, let alone a single professor. I know this because the dean sat us all down and said so. There were so many appeals, they had to bring us into the faculty panel in groups of three to four, not that it mattered. The whole thing was a formality as the die was cast. Two weeks later, we heard the news. Everyone, literally everyone, had gotten their appeal approved. Dr. J was given a formal warning by the uni and had most of his courses taken away, and they're now taught by other people. He still holds on to the computer architecture course and some freshman intro classes, but from what I've heard, he hasn't failed anyone for a long time. So, if you're a lazy jerk of a professor, be warned, you might get someone like me for a student who gets revenge on you and turns your job upside down. Entitled parent steals my badge and risks jail time over a gallon of milk. A little background to start off. I started a new job with the county about a month ago. I was hired to be a juvenile correction specialist. It's not a glamorous job, but I absolutely make sure my clients are safe, afforded every right they are entitled to, and I treat them with respect and dignity. That being said, I don't live in a great area, and my uniform looks a lot like a police officer's uniform, so I never wear it outside of work if I can help it, just because I don't want to deal with potential issues, which seems to be the right call after this incident. It is also important to note that during my orientation, my training officer spent a literal hour explaining the many ways that are appropriate and inappropriate when it comes to representing oneself. For instance, in our country, I'm considered and therefore legally allowed to refer to myself as an officer of the peace, an officer of the county, an officer of the court, and a correctional officer. At no point and for no reason am I ever legally allowed to represent myself as or imply that I am an officer of the law, a police officer, or any other title of that nature. If someone assumes I am a cop, I legally have to correct them or I could potentially lose my job, be fined, or even arrested based on the situation. I will point out, however, that my uniform and badge carry the same legal obligations and repercussions when it comes to damage, theft, etc. because it's all considered county property. So yesterday, I got done working a double and get ready to leave work. I hadn't expected the forced overtime, so I hadn't checked the weather for my evening shift. Lo and behold, I had left my windows cracked through a rainstorm and my extra shirt and jacket had gotten soaked. This would have been fine because it was dark, so I wasn't worried about someone seeing me going from my car to my house, but we were out of milk and I really needed to stop at the Mart of Walls. Normally, I'd just take off my uniform shirt and badge and throw on my extra shirt, but I didn't feel like donning a soggy top or going into the store in the tank top I wear under my uniform shirt. Plus, it was 15 minutes till close and I was just running in and out, so what's the worst that could happen? I ran in, grabbed the milk, grabbed some ice cream because why not, and headed to self-checkout. The line was pretty long and wrapped around towards the entrance, 
so I was in the entitled lady's direct line of sight when she stepped through the doors. While she didn't fit the mold of the traditional Karen, I think she still counts. She was an older lady, probably in her 50s, in heels and a very low-cut sundress, fake tan and fake hair. I clock her making a beeline straight for me in my periphery and continue staring straight forward because something about her seemed a little off. Maybe it was the odd gait with the slight stumble every few steps, or the fact that she was kind of mumbling to herself, but I had a feeling she was under the influence of something. She got about five feet away and I could smell the alcohol emanating from her. She then reached out and firmly tapped on my shoulder. The following is our conversation nearly word for word as best as I can remember. Karen, excuse me, I'm so glad I made it before they closed. Me, that's great. Continue staring forward, attempting to ignore her. Well, I just came in because I really needed milk for my kids' breakfast tomorrow. Do you think you could help me out a bit? Me, sure. The milk is on the wall at the back of the store. Just head straight back down that main aisle and you'll walk straight into the dairy section. She looks at me dumbly for several seconds. Well, that's not really what I meant. You see, I noticed that you have the same kind of milk that my family drinks, so I thought maybe you could let me have it. That way I can get home to my kids sooner. Me. No thank you, I'm good. Wait, what does that mean? I can't have the milk? Me. That is correct. You can take three minutes to walk back there and get your own milk, just like I did. That's how groceries work. Again, she stares at me for several moments, trying to process the situation going through the haze of intoxication. You are being incredibly rude, and you shouldn't even be in here. Me. How do you figure that? Karen. My tax dollars aren't supposed to be paying for the police to go shopping while on duty. Now give me that milk, and I want your badge number so that I can talk to your superiors about your inappropriate behavior. Me. Ma'am, I'm not a police officer, and I'm not on duty. I just happen to be coming home from work, and I still have my uniform on. Entitled parent, now starting to shriek and attract attention. You are obviously lying. I can see your badge right there. I won't let you get away with lying just to protect your job. At this point, she begins to claw at the badge-shaped patch that is sewn onto my upper right shoulder of my uniform shirt. Not wanting to escalate things further, I took a step back and grabbed my real badge to show her. Now, it's not like a metal badge or a jacketed ID like cops or detectives carry. It's literally a laminated card in a clear pouch attached to a retractable clip on my belt. The pocket also contains my electronic access card to the jail itself. The whole jail, not just the juvenile side, which was about to become a huge deal. Me, holding up badge. See how it says, correction specialist, not police officer? Bald as anything, this crazy drunk reaches out snatches my badge out of my hands and rips it off of my belt. Now at this point, the bystanders that had been nervously standing and muttering amongst themselves went silent because, like most sane and rational human beings, they realize that it's never a good idea to take the badge of someone in a uniform, whether they are a cop or not. I myself took a moment to respond because I truly could not understand the idiocy of stealing anything, let alone a badge over a gallon of milk. I would have been within my rights to grab her and force her to give it back, but again, I didn't want things getting out of hand, so I decided to reason with her. Me. Ma'am, I don't think you realize the consequences of what you've just done. This is the badge of a county officer, and stealing one is a misdemeanor if you're lucky. However, behind that badge is my swipe card for the jail. You've literally just stolen a key to the county jail, which is a felony with a potential 10-year sentence. This is absolutely true, by the way. I think you should probably hand it back to me now because I don't think a gallon of milk is really worth a decade of your life. Karen, now starting to look a little nervous. That's not what I meant to do. Looking at the bystanders for support. You saw how she was being rude to me, right? I was just trying to get her information and she wouldn't give it to me. I didn't do anything wrong, right? Unbeknownst to either of us, one of the customers ahead of us was either an off-duty cop or retired, I couldn't tell which. He piped up with, Ma'am, I'd do as the officer suggests if I were you. I can't slap cuffs on you right now, but I've got a few guys on speed dial that would happily do it for me. And since they patrol this area, I'd say you've only got a couple minutes to make your choice. And with that, he pulled out his phone and started swiping. All the color drained out of Karen's face, and she basically flung my badge at me as she rushed out of the store, ranting and mumbling loudly, something about how it was 
just a gallon of milk. I thanked the older guy and told him not to bother calling anyone. Everyone got through the checkout like responsible adult human beings and I got to go home and enjoy my ice cream, having learned that I should really just do my shopping on my days off. Edit. Not that it matters in context of this story, but I'm a smallish woman. It makes it a little bit funnier to me since I don't think I look anything like a stereotypical cop. Yes, I know there are many fabulously skilled women of all shapes and sizes in all branches of law enforcement. Also, I do agree with many of you posting that the cops should have been called because she was intoxicated. I probably should have thought that through better. All I can say is that the whole situation really threw me off because of her behavior it was just so out there. I was just glad that she finally left me alone before it became a huge deal and didn't really think anything beyond that. I did check the local accidents report this morning and thankfully, no one of her description was reported to have been in an accident due to drinking. So, that's lucky. Thanks for all the likes and the awards. I kicked out my mother-in-law because she wants my husband to leave me. I'm 24, female, and my husband, who's 25, male, and I just had a beautiful baby girl two months ago. His mom is a self-made entrepreneur, and she's honestly an inspiration to me. She's strong, intelligent, had fought hard for everything she owns, and before I got pregnant, we got along just fine. She supported me in my professional decisions and never showed any sign to not approve of our relationship. When we told my husband's parents that we were pregnant, his dad congratulated us and looked so happy to be a grandfather. His mom, not so much. She quickly asked us what were we going to do and that if we didn't want to have the kid, she would support us. She believed that we both had promising futures and if we had a baby this early in our careers, we'll never fulfill our dreams. But my husband and I assured her that we had everything planned. We both agreed that I was going to dedicate a year to our daughter and then I was going to go back to work. We never asked them for a penny and neither of us waited for them to fund our new lifestyle. My mother-in-law didn't like it. My husband had a good job, had just enrolled himself on a master's degree and now he's going to be a father and the breadwinner of the house. For her, it was too much on his shoulders. So a few days ago, she came to my house and proposed an experiment to me. She told me that during the rest of the year I was going to be a stay-at-home mom, I could go back to my parents. This will allow my husband to come home and rest after a long day of work or school, and during the weekends, he could come to me and visit us if he had the energy to do so. I said that it wasn't fair since she was our daughter and not just mine, and that she shouldn't expect my husband to not have any kind of responsibility towards her. She said that after I ruined my husband's life with an early baby, that's the least I could do. That I was going to grow comfortable after one year of doing basically nothing, and that if my husband was lucky, this would end on a divorce, which for her is the best outcome by now. I couldn't believe what she was proposing to me, and told her that she was crazy for even thinking that, and that our baby didn't appear magically in my belly. I kicked her out, and when my husband came home, I told him everything. We decided to cut contact with his mom, but I can't get the fact that she said I ruined his life out of my head. I'm not planning on being a stay-at-home mom forever, and to be honest, I do want to get back to work. I'm an architect while my husband is an engineer, and I very much enjoy my career. He does come home from work tired, but our baby isn't a big problem. She doesn't cry all the time, and we get her to calm down very easily. Also, it's not like I'm home doing nothing. I do small projects for my friend's firm every now and then as a freelancer, and I have a position waiting for me there. My husband and I just decided that I had to remain available for our daughter the first year, in case anything happens, because this is our first baby. Edit. Whoa, thank you for all of your input. I can't believe this blew up. My mother-in-law hasn't always been like this, but after we decided to have the baby, her behavior changed completely. I'll answer some of your questions you left. Again, thank you so much. Karen tries to force me to cover her shift, ends up losing her job. Okay, so I, female 21, work in a small and private liquid and tobacco store. We have a total of 10 workers. For most of them, it's their second job. Only I and three other co-workers only have this job. However, I'm a college student, so I'm not working many hours, usually only 10 hours a week. Last Friday morning, one of my co-workers, Alyssa, asked me if I could cover her shift. I declined because since I started working there three years ago, I'm constantly covering shifts for other people. However, when I ask for people to cover my shift or trade shifts, nobody returns the favor. So in the last six months, I started to decline as well, unless someone is actually sick or so. Alyssa said it's urgent 
and since it was the Friday closing shift, I assume she just wants to go partying since she's known to ask for covering her shifts on the weekend so she can go party. I suggested that she can ask some other coworker. She only said that nobody is willing to cover her shift and I just said, sorry, but I can't. This conversation was exclusively via text message. Yesterday when I came to work, my other coworker, Tara, she's kind of friends with Alyssa, at least at work, was upset. I asked her what was wrong and she just said that I'm a selfish jerk and then explained that Alyssa apparently wanted to have her shift covered because she was asked to come to some meeting with her boss at her main work and since she missed it, she was fired. Apparently, she was on the verge of being fired before and the meeting was to talk out stuff with her boss and since she didn't come, she couldn't explain herself and that sealed the deal for her boss. Coworker and I had a fight then. I told her that Alyssa didn't tell me why exactly she wanted her shift covered and if I had known the exact reason, I probably would have done it. Tara said that Alyssa didn't need to give me the real reason and the indicator that it's urgent should have been enough. When I said that Alyssa had said such things in the past just to go out partying, she just insisted that I just cannot assume that someone is lying when they say it's urgent. I asked Tara why she didn't cover the shift and she just said that since she's working 40 hours a week, she needs every rest she can get and basically said that since I'm just a college student, I shouldn't be so difficult about working a few more hours. I'm feeling really crappy about this. I know that I didn't know the real reason why she wanted her shift covered, but maybe I really should have just believed her when she said it was urgent. I don't know if I should talk to Alyssa and what to say to her. Am I the jerk? Edit. Didn't expect this to blow up overnight. First of all, thanks to all the nice comments telling me it's okay to say no. While I'm doing it, since I was completely overworked in the past, I still sometimes feel guilty about saying no. But somehow, it feels nice that people validate this. Secondly, a lot of you said that her story sounds fishy. I personally didn't question it at first because we sometimes have meetings with our boss after closing time, 9 p.m., as well at the store. But the more people commented, the more I started to doubt Alyssa's story as well. Her main work is in retail as well, so I assumed it was just a stay here after the shift thing. But she didn't bother to call our boss to say it's important. And again, some people say it's unusual to have such talks on Fridays and it's also unusual to get told about such a meeting with basically no advance. Either Alyssa didn't care about the interview as much, or she lied about having it. I'm not sure, and to be honest, I'm not sure I want to know. I will just stand firm as you all have told me to do, and try not to let them guilt trip me. Entitled Parent Wants Refund on Students' Dining Plan A few days ago, we had freshman orientation at the college where I work. I was in the dining hall when this particular event happened. Note that all meals were comped by the college this past week, so no one was paying for anything. Not students, not faculty or staff, not parents, except for the fancy stuff at the campus version of Starbucks, which is in the front of the dining hall. Mother comes in with her four kids. One is a new student on our campus, the other three are the younger siblings. Student shows her new ID card, which is all they've had to do this week to get into the dining hall for free. Entire family goes through, no one pays for anything. Not five minutes later, I hear raised voices near the table. I was sitting fairly close to the cash register in the coffee shop area. Mother and all four kids come back to the cash register and the mother is yelling that she wants a refund because the only food in the dining hall is burgers and fries and chicken tenders and pizza. The cashier is trying to explain to her that she couldn't give her a refund since all of the meals were free that day so she hadn't paid to begin with and the woman says she wants a refund on her daughter's dining plan because the food isn't worth eating. Note that there is nowhere else nearby where her daughter can get meals. The nearest restaurants and grocery store are in the next town over, 15 miles away, and freshmen aren't allowed to have cars on our campus. So if the daughter doesn't have a meal plan with the dining hall, she's not going to be eating. This lady keeps yelling at the poor cashier who finally calls her manager who comes up and says the dining hall itself can't process refunds anyway and they'd have to talk to campus administration about it. But he reiterated to her that if her daughter didn't have a meal plan, she'd have nowhere to get food. This lady looks at him and says, Fine, we'll be going over to administration right now and unenrolling her from the classes here. She can't possibly go to school here with nothing to eat but burgers and pizza. The poor daughter was standing there looking absolutely devastated and the other kids looked mortified. I honestly thought the student was going to start crying. No idea what happened after that because they left the building but oh my goodness did I ever feel sorry for that poor girl. 
to be pulled out of college on her first day because her mother didn't like the food the dining hall served? And if they actually went through with it, I really hope they didn't, she won't be able to get into another school until January at the earliest. And if she was a scholarship student, a lot of our kids are, it may take a full year to be able to get a scholarship somewhere else. The really sad thing was, the very basic burgers and pizza menu the dining hall was running that day was only because meals were free and they were trying to save some money on it. They also knew it would be busy with the parents on campus, so they were making foods that are easy to prepare in mass quantities. Also, if they had stuck around long enough for dinner, they would have gotten much more fancier meal options. And starting Monday, there will also be a full salad bar and self-serve deli available at lunch and dinner. But since apparently baby girl was far too important to eat normal food like every other student on just about every other college campus out there, they're just going to make her go back home again. That poor, poor kid. And honestly, her poor three younger siblings too. I felt sorry for all of them. How not to recruit a nurse. In nursing school, you have clinical days. The day before clinical, you have to go to the hospital and pick a patient you'll work with the next day. You also have a chance to work as a CNA while in school to gain more experience and make a little money because it's difficult to work full-time and go through nursing school. There were two hospitals in my small town. I worked at Hospital A in the ICU as a CNA. My clinicals were in the larger hospital, Hospital B. I worked a day shift at my hospital and ran over to the other one across town to pick my patient and get my pre-clinical work done. It was about 30 minutes after 7 when I got there. Most hospital shifts you work are 12 hours, 7 to 7. I knew I was going to be on a med surge floor, so I got on the elevator to ride up and looked through my paperwork to find out what unit I'd be at the next day. A lady in a pantsuit with a hospital badge was already on the elevator and gave me a look like I had peed in her Cheerios. Okay, I just moved to the side and finally found my paper letting me know what floor and unit I needed to go to. In a really ugly tone, the pantsuit asked, Where are you headed? Me, staying polite. I'm headed to 3N. She slammed the button and just said, Thank you. As we were riding, she turned to me and started chewing me out. It's not appropriate for you to be coming in 20 minutes after shift change. We've been understaffed all day and those units are slammed right now. I just kind of stared at her for a second and thought, I'm not going to be disturbing the nurses, and if I have to wait on a chart, that's fine. I don't intend on interrupting report, but I just said, okay. If anything, her face got angrier. My floor arrived, and she stepped out with me and kept pace with me as I headed to the nurse's station. I went to the side and took a look at the assignment board to see if anyone had a diagnosis I hadn't worked with before, then sat down out of the way and waited quietly because the charge nurses were still discussing assignments. When they finished, I'd ask the charge nurse if there was a patient I should pick. I do this because sometimes there were interesting procedures or I'd get a chance to practice my skills the next day. As I was waiting, pantsuit lady watched me and when she saw me sit down, she immediately snapped her fingers at me and pointed down to the floor and said, You come here. The voice was nasty enough that it stopped several people mid-report to find out what was going on. I stood up and approached her and she grabbed my sleeve and pulled me over closer to the charge nurses. Ignoring me and talking directly to the charge nurses, she proceeded to tell them that I was their aide and she wanted them to make sure I was written up for being late. I realized then that she thought I worked there. I was a lot less confrontational or aggressive then. My how nursing changes you. But I never really got the chance to say anything as she jerked my hand away from me and wiped it like she had just touched doo-doo. Looked at me with a face I can only describe as sour lemon smugness and walked away. The charge looked at me and said, We already have an aide, but sure could use you. Let me see how. She trailed off as I held out my hand and said, I don't work here. I'm with my school and I'm here to pick out a patient for clinicals tomorrow. Does that lady always treat people like their dogs? The charge nurse stared at me for a second and then started laughing and said, Stupid jerk, don't mind her, we all hate her. She then asked, How much longer do you have? I replied that I graduate in six months. I also asked if they had any interesting procedures or if they had a patient that a one-to-one -one student nurse would make easier to handle. She also asked where I planned on working after I graduated. I just looked down the hallway where the pantsuit had gone and just said, Well, not here which made her laugh even more. I had a truly relaxing clinical the next day with a sweet elderly lady with dementia and a minor medical condition. 
We folded laundry together to keep her busy and to keep her from pulling at her surgical sites. What was really fun about it is that the next semester when representatives came to try to recruit you to the hospital, I got to reply to a question about why I wasn't interested in their hospital. I got to say that I didn't appreciate the way they treated their staff and tell the story. There was recognition in their eyes when I described the lady and they shook their heads when I told them about the event. Plus, I knew that my hospital was waiting for me to graduate so I could come to work in the ICU, which was my dream at the time. And it was for a bit more pay than the other hospital was offering anyway. My coworker just pulled off a bye Felicia to some impatient jerk. We've got limited outside seating and one server to cover the section. When the weather's nice, that server invariably gets slammed because everybody wants to sit out there. Like clockwork, every party that walks through the door was asking to sit outside like a trail of lemmings. We had just quadruple set Wendy, top tier veteran server, because she can handle it, but decided to put a pause on any further tables for a cool 10 minutes so she could catch up. This older couple walks in and goes, Party of two, and we're ready to order. Great, we tell them. We'll just seat you by the window here. No, we want to sit outside. All right, well, the server is a little behind, so we're putting a pause on any further tables for about 10 minutes, if you don't mind waiting. Yeah, okay. Can you at least seat us at that table? This should have been the cue to say no, but the host didn't want to deal with them hanging out in the lobby anymore, so went ahead and set them. She reminded them, your server, Wendy, is really busy, so hang tight and she'll eventually get to you. Not two minutes later, the husband walks in and asks, Hey, can anyone at least take our drink order? Wendy is standing at the bar collecting drinks with an earshot and yells out, Sir, I'll get to you soon. Please have a seat. He walks over to Wendy. Are you the server? Two gin and tonics, please, and we're ready to order. Please have a seat. Wendy comes over to the host's stand to better understand the situation and realizes it's not the host's fault. These people are just jerks. She comes outside to drop the drinks off and takes another table's order. The guy has his finger in the air trying to get her attention. This makes her livid, and she purposefully, passive-aggressively ignores the heck out of them while handling all of the other tables. We call this putting the guest in the penalty box. We're gonna ice you off for five minutes until you start behaving like a respectful person. I don't think it had even been the 10 minutes, but Ken and his wife angrily return inside to let the hosts know. The service is terrible here. We're leaving. Wendy sees them leaving and just blurts out, Bye Felicia. The couple turned to look but was none the wiser and most of the staff around the restaurant just burst out laughing. Be patient with understaffed restaurants, people. Am I the jerk for telling my mom I know she spent my inheritance? Backstory. My, 27 female, mom, who's 53, has had a really hard life. At age eight, she was adopted into a loving, wealthy family of two college professors along with an adopted brother. She had a hard time adjusting, made a lot of bad decisions, and basically ran away in her late teens. In total, she has five kids, four boys, with me being the middle girl. We grew up very, very poor, with our mother always gone or bringing back strangers to party, leaving me to raise the youngest two. That being said, I loved my grandparents dearly, and they loved us kids back, and as much as they struggled with my mom, they were nothing but loving towards her from what I understand. My grandparents passed when I was in 5th and 7th grade, and this crushed me. I wasn't able to articulate any of it at the time, but that's when severe depression rolled in. From there on, school was very difficult for me, as well as my home life. I ended up falling pretty deep into my sorrow and stopped going to school around my junior year of high school. After a breakthrough, I decided that I had to get the heck away from that house and ultimately moved out at age 17 to a bigger city about 45 minutes away. I barely finished high school with a 1.75 GPA and somehow two teachers from the new school convinced me to sign up for the community college. They helped me fill out my FAFSA and everything. I worked full time, busted my butt, and after four years, I finally achieved an AS. I was able to transfer over to a university that I would have never been able to attend right out of high school due to my grades and whatnot and finish my BS in my favorite field of science. In total, it took me six years to get my BS degree, but I worked so hard and I was so proud of what I was able to accomplish. Anyway, I graduated college with 40k in student debt. Not so bad compared to most, I always thought. 
I knew that I would have to work hard and accrue debt to get what I wanted in life, so this was a necessary burden and I've accepted that. However, things have turned in recent events when I reached out to my grandparents' close personal friends, let's call them the Johnsons, to get a better idea of what my grandparents were like. In conversation, it came out that Grandpa left a $150,000 inheritance for his grandkids' education. However, three years later, around 2010, my mother came to the Johnsons and confessed to them that she blew all of the education money. My relationship with her was already strained, but this really crossed a line for me. I emailed her, telling her I know what she did, and told her not to contact me again. The Johnsons quickly got in contact with me, telling me it was a long time ago, and she's improved a lot since then, and that I shouldn't have told her they told me. I think I have the right to confront her, but they say I violated their trust. Am I the jerk? Can't you just make me one now? This just happened this morning at Costco. Our store sells prepared salads, including Caesar, Greek, pasta, etc. This morning we were shopping and witnessed the following. We've got entitled shopper, loudly to herself. Oh, I guess there aren't any Caesar salads. She makes a show of sorting through the other salads as though a sneaky Caesar salad might be hiding underneath the pasta primavera, despite being the size of a truck tire. Karen, again to herself, but clearly for everyone's benefit. I thought they would have Caesar salads. She looks around, craning her head to see into the meat department where a couple of hapless butchers are making sausages. She waves to catch their attention. They nod and continue on with their work. Karen, oh, I guess they're too busy to help a customer. She continues poking at the salads and occasionally looking around to see if anyone is paying attention. She mutters and huffs and sighs deeply. My wife reaches in past her to pick up a Greek salad. Karen tells my wife, Don't they make Caesar salads here anymore? Wife, I think so. They were here last time I was here. Karen nods towards the butchers. I guess they're too busy to make them today. Wife shrugs. I don't know. Just then an employee approaches. Karen, Excuse me, girl. Yes. Do you have any Caesar salads? I can't find any. Employee. No, sorry, we don't have any today. Well, I need one for my dinner party tonight. Can't you just make one for me now? Employee. No, sorry. I don't believe this. Is there anyone else I can talk to? Employee. Not really, no, this is my area. Why can't they? Nods at the sausage makers. Make me one. Employee. They're not... Of course. I understand they're so busy. Do you think they could stop for a few seconds and put together a simple salad for a customer? Employee. As I was saying, no, they can't. By this point, a small crowd of shoppers is starting to watch. Go, Karen, go. I am very disappointed in the service here. At my store, they believe in customer service. Employee out of patience. Ma'am. Butcher shop employees do not touch the produce due to cross-contamination. Raises voice to talk over her as she starts to raise objections again. We don't have Caesar salads today because we didn't get a shipment of romaine lettuce. I don't appreciate your tone. I want to speak to someone else. Employee. Good luck with that. And walked away. Karen stood there in rage as the other shoppers, myself included, laughed and jeered. After a few seconds, she harumphed loudly and pushed her cart off towards the cheese aisle. I lived my server dream, but from the other side of the table. Some background. I'm a server at a high-end Italian restaurant where I've been working for a little over two years. My boyfriend and his best friend, who I'll call Buddy, own a home together, and they rent the bottom floor of that home out to a woman who I'll call Drizilla. Drizilla is a narcissist, total false main character case and she has gone so far as to make herself a website and Wikipedia page. I usually avoid this woman because if you let her, she'll ramble at you for hours. Last night, boyfriend and I made plans to grab dinner and drinks with Buddy. Drizilla overheard us making those plans from a floor away. Is this woman a bat? And said that she'd tag along, not that we had asked her or anything. We wait for Drizilla to ready her bat body. It must require great preparation because we manage to watch two whole episodes of Wife Swap whilst we wait. We head downtown, Batwoman tenant in tow, and grab an outdoor table at a favorite cocktail bar of mine. We peruse the menu, and I notice that Drizilla's face is twisted up in maybe disgust, maybe confusion, maybe indigestion. 
I explain some of the cocktails to her and make no headway. A server approaches and I give her a preemptive, I'm sorry, sort of glance. As I order, Drizilla interrupts me and says, What is up with this menu? Don't you have anything normal? The server directs her to the first cocktail, as I too had done. It's a basic margarita, but with the addition of a house-made syrup. That sounds weird, Drizilla hymns and haws. Do you have anything like a gin and tonic? The server enthusiastically points out their house spin on gin and tonic, as I too had done. That sounds awful. Server points out a few other of the more basic cocktails, understanding with every suggestion that this isn't about appeasing a guest, but more about being toyed with by a woman who is part bat, part menace. We wait, all of us, as Drizilla proceeds to ask about at least 80% of the cocktail menu. I'll take this cocktail. That's nothing like anything I'd asked about or hinted towards wanting. Server leaves, and Drizella asks why the server couldn't have suggested the cocktail she ended up ordering. I whip my face towards her and say, You shot down everything he suggested, all while proving no helpful feedback about what you wanted. Usually when that happens to me at work, I leave the guests to read the menu. She interrupts me a number of times as I'm saying this, so I repeat it once more, but much more loudly this time. Buddy snickers, boyfriend cackles, Drizilla pouts. As we wait for our drinks, Drizilla starts shivering dramatically, as 75 degrees is practically an icy tundra. She grabs for the outdoor heater and I swat her hand away. Every time a member of the service staff passes near our table, Drizilla loudly remarks about how long our craft cocktails are taking. On this very busy night where the servers clearly have nine table or more sections and there's only one bartender to service this bustling establishment. Drinks arrive and Drizilla complains that her cocktail has too much ice. How am I even supposed to see how much alcohol is in there? She frowns the entire time her drink is in hand. I grab the check as soon as it's dropped, leave 30% and apologize to our server on the way out. We head to another restaurant for dinner and the host says it'll be around 20 minutes for a table. Drizilla, now full of alcohol and something that probably feels like bravery but is actually jerkness, walks up to a nearby table and half asks, half spits, Why can't we sit here? It's very clearly a service station. We wait for 10 minutes, all the while Drizilla pouts and whines. She says something about going up to stare at the hostess, and that's where I draw the line. You won't be doing that, because that's rude. It seems like maybe you're better off making your own meal tonight. She quietly agrees, and I drive her home. Boyfriend and I return to the restaurant, where we have a lovely dinner and both agree that we will not attempt to dine out with Drizilla again. I'm still riding that sweet, sweet eye of finally being able to tell a jerk customer to buzz off. You can eat at the hotel. A long, long time ago, in the late 90s, when I was a young IT consultant, I was sent out of state on an assignment. The sales manager decided to make all of the travel arrangements for me and my coworker. We were to stay at a Holiday Inn type hotel that he booked for us. When I asked about daily expenses and a rental car, the sales manager told me that the hotel had a shuttle that would take us to work site and we could eat at the hotel restaurant. I tried to argue with him that I'd like to see the town or eat somewhere other than the hotel, but he wouldn't budge. He paid for the flights and the rooms and we would charge our meals to our room. Anything else would be paid for out of our own pockets. I was young and broke, so I didn't have much of a choice. I settled into the expectation that I would have a boring week of hotel slash work slash hotel for five days. When my coworker and I arrived at the hotel, we were quite surprised to find that it wasn't at all a Holiday Inn type hotel, in spite of the fact that it had Inn in the name. It was quite fancy, and the rooms were comfortable and spacious. The hotel restaurant, though, was something my lower middle class self had never experienced. This was a restaurant that didn't print prices on the menu. In fact, I couldn't even pronounce half of the items listed. Meals were a set cost regardless of what you ordered. Breakfast was $40 per person. Lunches and dinners were $60 per person. Knowing we had no car and no way to expense anything that wasn't charged to the room, my coworker and I dutifully ate three meals a day in the hotel restaurant. I had five days of filet mignon for breakfast and various gourmet lunches and dinners while the hotel shuttle took us to and from the workplace all week. Now, years later, I'm not even sure I remember the city I was in or the work I was doing, 
but I remember a week of filet mignon for breakfast and the look in the eyes of the sales manager when he saw his credit card statement. That was a great trip. Am I the jerk for asking my husband not to bring his friend around? I'm 43, female, and my husband, who's 45, has a friend, Todd, who's 39, that he's been hanging out with since we moved to our new state for work five years ago. When we first moved here, I struggled to find a new job. Todd would make passive-aggressive comments about how nice it must be to have someone support me. When I told my husband about it, he told me that Todd was joking and didn't mean it. I told him that it offended me and that I didn't find it funny, and he told me that I was taking it out of context. Since then, Todd has made more offensive comments. Last month, when I brought my husband a coffee and some food to his work, he was working overtime and he was tired and hungry. Todd saw me in the parking lot and remarked about how nice it must be to have a wife that brings coffee and food on command. I told him that I was not a dog and do not talk to me like that. The next day, when he saw my husband, he told him about the conversation we had in the parking lot and said that I was rude to him for no reason. So I told my husband what he said and I told him that I will not be spoken to like that. My husband told me that I need to relax and that he didn't mean to be rude. Last week was the last straw. I replaced my phone after seven years of having it. I had been saving money for six months to pay straight cash for the new phone. Unbeknownst to me, my husband had ordered it for me as a surprise. I was so excited and happy to finally have a phone that worked right. The night that I got it, we went out to dinner and ran into Todd while we were waiting for a table. Apparently, he knew that my husband was getting me a new phone and even remarked how spoiled I was and how hard my husband works for me to just spend his money. I saw red. I told him that first of all, I didn't spend his money, he did, that I have a job and I'm more than capable of buying my own phone, and that he was a petty, jealous jerk who was angry because he can't find a girlfriend who will put up with his crap, so he takes it out on me because I'm the only woman who will speak to him. We ended up just going home and my husband gave me the silent treatment the whole ride home. As soon as we walked into the door, he told me that I embarrassed him. I told him that I was embarrassed when his friend told me that I was some kind of money-grubbing leech and he just stood there and allowed it to happen. I told him that I do not want Todd around anymore and that he wasn't welcome in the house. My husband thinks I'm overreacting and that's just how Todd is. My sister demands I share my $6 million inheritance with her. Hello Reddit, I don't have anyone I can share these thoughts with in person so I'm hoping you guys can help me resolve this. I, 20 male, am a single child, or at least I thought I was. Just over a year ago, I discovered that I have a sister, Lucy. The story goes that my mother had a kid with her first boyfriend while she was in college, and they couldn't support her, so they opted for adoption at birth. My father was aware of this, but I was never told. Anyways, about a year ago, she made contact with my slash our mother. They've gotten on pretty well, keep in touch, and go on the odd lunch. Lucy's also attended a couple of our family events this past year. Her and I get along fine as well. We're different people, so not friends, so I sort of see her as an acquaintance slash friend of the family, I guess. It's a little odd because I know we're closely related, but at the same time, she doesn't feel like family, if that makes sense. Okay, so there's the backstory. Now on to the dilemma. Our grandparents on my mother's side both passed a few years ago. My mother was their only child, and I, their only grandchild, and they left their entire estate to me. This was known to my parents and me before they passed, as they had expressed it when they made their will. My parents are well off financially. Mom's a nurse, dad's a doctor, and so they were fine with the arrangement. I was given access to the money on my 20th birthday, and the sum of money was much larger than I expected, totaling around $6 million. This is why I can't really talk about this with anyone impartial because I don't really want friends, etc. to know. Anyway, a few weeks ago, my mother set me down and asked me to share the money with Lucy. Now, here's the thing. Like I said, to me, Lucy is essentially an acquaintance. I know we're related by blood, but I don't exactly feel the type of connection to her that would merit giving her such a large sum of money, or any money at all for that matter. So I explained that to my mother, and she wasn't exactly happy with my answer. She believes I'm being extremely selfish, and that Lucy could very much benefit from this money as well since she's still a college student and in debt. Here's why I think I might be the jerk. I don't really see that as my problem. I believe family is who feels like family, not who shares your DNA. Secondly, my grandparents were aware of Lucy's existence, even though they never met her, and they chose to leave everything to me all the same. 
Also, it is not as though Lucy grew up poor in the foster system or anything. She was adopted at birth by what seems like two great people. Her adoptive parents are an accountant and a teacher. P.S. I do not plan to just hoard the money. I'm starting law school this year and plan to use it to start my own firm once I'm finished. So go forth and judge me, please. Am I being a selfish jerk here? Or am I justified in thinking that simply being related by blood doesn't merit any claim here? Karen demands I get rid of my daddy's number one princess t-shirt. I, 20 female, lost my dad two years ago, and since then, it's been revealed that he had another daughter, Amanda, who's 25. Before my dad met my mom, he was involved with another woman and dumped her when he found out that she was engaged to another man. The guy was military and overseas, so my dad had no way of contacting him and he didn't know the woman well enough to reach out to any mutual friends, although my dad did later regret not trying harder. Unbeknownst to my dad, he accidentally got her pregnant and she tried to pass Amanda off as her fiancé's, but it didn't work. She eventually married someone else, but later divorced and the guy completely cut contact. Because of this, Amanda always wanted to know who my dad was and tried reaching out to him but didn't have much luck because, again, they didn't know each other long. My dad wasn't from there. He moved away and changed his contact information. Eventually, Amanda got a hit through 23andMe through my cousin and reached out. By that time, my dad was already gone, but his parents, siblings, and their kids were more than welcoming. My brother and I were pretty weirded out by this, and since our dad wasn't on her birth certificate, we didn't believe her until there was a DNA test. I wish I could say that this was some magical moment where we all hugged and are now besties, but honestly, I don't feel this strong familial tie to her because I didn't grow up with her. My brother says he feels the same, but we both make the effort to be nice when she's around. Up until Amanda came around, I was my dad's only daughter, and because of this, he had a lot of daddy's favorite daughter type of things, because I was his only daughter at the time. It was like a fun little joke between us. Out of all the things he's given me in relation to this theme that I cherish most is a custom-made t-shirt he got me with a picture of us at a father-daughter dance when I was 12 and the caption, Daddy's Number One Princess. It was one of the last things my dad ever gave me and I love it very much. I never showed it to Amanda, but I guess someone else told her and she gently confronted me about it and asked me to get rid of it and anything else like this. She expressed how she's been in therapy to cope with never having a true father figure and that her actual father passed without ever meeting her and knowing that I was his favorite daughter was really upsetting her. I told her that while I am sad about this situation and won't ever bring it up around her, I'm not getting rid of it. I thought Amanda and I had an understanding until my aunt called and berated me for not being respectful to my sister's feelings and that getting rid of a t-shirt that I don't even wear is a small sacrifice because I at least have the memories of having a loving father while Amanda doesn't. Am I the jerk? ETA, because I keep seeing this, I just wanted to clarify certain things. 1. My mom and dad were never married and broke up before I was born, and I'm currently living with her, so that's where the bulk of my daddy's number one princess types of things are at, and Amanda has no reason to come to my mom's house, so I'm not worried about things going missing. 2. I have spoken to my brother, and he agrees that so long as I don't wear them and or bring them up around Amanda, I should have the right to keep them. 3. My grandparents are trying to stay neutral in this because they see both sides of the argument. Am I the jerk for telling my employee they can't eat before their break? Newly promoted, I have an employee who consistently comes in, in my opinion, not ready to work. 3 days, 12 hour shifts, ER hospital. As soon as she comes in, busy or not, she claims she can't do anything until she goes and gets a coffee. Then 3-4 to four hours into her 12 hour shift, she orders food to be delivered and claims she can't do anything because she needs to eat or she's going to get very angry. This includes not answering code blues or responding to emergencies while she eats and she takes 20 to 30 minute breaks. I've compromised and told her she can take her break early then and she told me that doesn't count as her break because she doesn't use her break to eat. She uses it to drive around and de-stress. So six to seven hours into her shift, she takes a 30 minute break. I've also told her she can nibble on a snack when we aren't busy as long as she responds to any emergencies and resumes working as needed. But again, she tells me she's going to get very hungry if she doesn't get food in her. I've asked her if she eats before she comes to work and she tells me no, she barely wakes up on time to get to work as it is and she won't wake up any earlier to eat at home. 
I have personally brought snacks that can be nibbled on throughout the shift if an employee just needs something to get by. From my understanding, in the past, this behavior was allowed because we weren't busy and had a lot of downtime. But since lockdown started, we have been very busy. We are missing over 50% of our staff, so I can't have an employee waste this much time on the clock. We have 50% staff because people chose to find a different career field that was stay at home. We're getting paid more for working less as a travel, compassion fatigue, not because of one break that's always been the standard for decades. Now she's telling new employees that I starve my staff and overwork them, but I just don't see how I'm being unreasonable here. I eat before I get to work and bring my own coffee from home to sip throughout work. If she can't make that effort to be prepared for a 12-hour shift, I can't help that. That's her decision. I need to know if I'm the jerk before deciding how to address this. ETA. I did not expect for this to blow up. Just to clear the air. We work in a hospital setting with direct patient care. We have always had one 30-minute break. This employee has worked this type of shift for 8 years now. This is a typical shift for a hospital worker. Nobody else has a problem with this and can do time management to eat on the go as needed or take the time to sit when slow. There are plenty of opportunities for her to work 8-hour shifts instead and she chooses to work 12 to get 4 days off. I do not have any problems with any other employees and they understand to snack when they can, they can eat for a minute or two when they can, or they can sit for 10 minutes if we are slow. This employee is doing this when we are busy and not able to sit at the moment and she refuses to do any work during this time if needed, including not responding to code blues, asking others to cover for her workload. Other employees are upset with having to cover her workload. I do provide snacks that can be nibbled on, but she refuses to eat those and wants full meals that require her to sit for 20 minutes. Again, she chooses to not eat during her break, so that's why she's eating while working. I'll clarify that the snacks I provide consist of guacamole, queso, salsa and chips, breakfast tacos, sausage rolls, donuts, yogurt, fries, fruit, trail mix, nuts, salads, bread, deli meat, PB&J, and condiments. These employees are allowed to eat these when they can as long as it doesn't interfere with patient care. Am I the jerk for walking out on a bachelorette party when I'm the maid of honor? I went to a bachelorette party in Atlantic City. After a four-hour drive, the bride, who we'll call Melissa, could not be bothered to get out of her seat and give me a hug or introduce me to the other girls. No one made any effort to get to know me at dinner. When the bill came, the girls said we had split it evenly, which was unfair to me because I don't drink alcohol and they all ordered multiple drinks. There were 11 girls and I didn't want to be the only one who didn't want to split the bill, so I ended up having to pay $65 for my $13 meal. Then we went to a nightclub. When we got out around 2 a.m., my ears were ringing so much I couldn't sleep that night. Despite not sleeping, I got up early Saturday because we were going to an escape room at noon. I made the entire house breakfast so the girls could eat quickly and we could make it on time, but they overslept and we missed it. Then we got brunch and the ride over was a nightmare. I should mention I was appointed designated driver. Half the girls took an Uber since my car only seats 5 people and the other half went with me, including Melissa. It was storming in AC and the streets were flooded. I'm talking water up to my thighs. I didn't think my old car would make it. The girls could see what kind of car I drive and decided to complain about how they can't file their taxes jointly with their husbands because their combined income would be over $400,000, all while I chauffeured them. Not only was splitting the bill unfair to me because I don't drink, but since I was driving everyone around, I was the only one paying for gas and parking fees. They insisted on splitting the brunch bill too, so I had to pay $45 for my $15 lunch. After the rain stopped, we went to the boardwalk to do a scavenger hunt. Melissa chose the teams and she didn't even put me on her team. I'm her maid of honor and yet she didn't want to spend that extra time with her best friend? Then the girls wanted to get drinks on the boardwalk where I was again excluded from conversation. I was the only quirky girl amongst sorority types. We were scheduled for a booze cruise with an arrival time of 5.30pm. So as it started nearing 5, I said we should get going but the girls wanted to finish their drinks and we had to scramble to get out of there. Again, half the girls took an Uber and the other half went with me, but we couldn't find my car. Melissa started flipping out about missing the cruise, so the girls took an Uber and ditched me in the parking garage. At this point, I broke down and started sobbing. I drove back to the Airbnb, $450 per person, and packed up my stuff. I left around 9pm and drove through the night. 
No one texted me to see if I made it home. Melissa hasn't talked to me since. I guess she's mad at me for leaving. Am I the jerk for leaving? Did I overreact? Bruh, that one hit me right in the feels. I can't have a pay raise, but my work trip hotel bills are paid for? Okay. My first proper job was around 1990 in London, which is famously one of the more expensive cities in the world. My salary was £1,000 per month, easy to remember. I don't know what the national or London average salary for a young graduate was back then, but I was definitely earning at the low end of the pay spectrum. Especially because it was work that required some quite specialist skills and a lot of discretion. I can't give details without risking of making myself identifiable, but let's just say that the organization was owned by one of the wealthiest men in England, and my task was politically sensitive, as I had access to private information about some very famous public people. The pay was bad, but I enjoyed the work, and one of its big perks was that I had to go to Paris for about one week each month. While I was there, my hotel was paid for automatically, and my meals were reimbursed when I submitted receipts. Anyway, after several months, I felt that I had proven myself to be hardworking, competent, reliable, discreet, etc. So I asked for a raise, explaining that I was finding it hard living in London on my salary. They could not fault my work, but brushed me off with a vague suggestion that maybe we could revisit the question of pay at some unspecified later date. At this time, the place I was living in didn't have a washing machine, which was fine with me, as I didn't want to spend a portion of my meager income on buying one. Plus, there was a laundry mat very close by, and I enjoyed reading the newspapers each Sunday morning while my clothes went around and round in soapy circles. Once or twice, though, I had to go to Paris late in the week when I didn't have a lot of clean clothes, so I'd take what clean items I had and get some socks and underwear cleaned by the hotel laundry service after I'd worn them. It soon dawned on me that my bosses never queried the extra expenses of laundry. Maybe the hotel just billed them for the total amount of each of my visits without itemizing the details. I don't know, and I didn't ask. Cue the malicious compliance. Apparently, I couldn't have a pay increase, but I could get laundry done at the hotel in Paris. Okay. For the rest of the time I worked in that job, I used to save up all my dirty clothes, including shirts, trousers, etc., and take it with me from London to Paris to have it laundered there. I felt a bit bad about this, because hotels always charge exorbitant prices for this service, Washing my clothes was maybe costing an extra 20 pounds each trip I made, but I was saving myself 2 pounds at the laundromat. There was never any fallout as such for the laundry issue. After a year, I told them that I had been offered a paid internship in the USA, and they said they would increase my salary if I stayed working for them in London, but I took great pleasure in telling them that their offer was too little too late, and that I wasn't interested. Malicious compliance used for good instead of evil. My story occurred many years ago when I worked at a regional supply warehouse for a company who specialized in a certain kind of widget. I worked in the office taking calls from customers and working with the warehouse staff to get orders picked and shipped. Office staff communicated with the warehouse over the PA system. Only those of us in the office and supervisors had access to the PA system. Protocol was that we would state the person's name we were communicating with first and then state whatever we had to say. We were to repeat it at least once. Being easily bored, I never repeated things exactly the same while injecting subtle humor where I could. All of it professional and above reproach, of course. There was a quality control department of two people who monitored the warehouse staff and helped when things went awry. These people knew the warehouse from end to end and were often called to find widgets that went missing. There was some friction between the office staff and quality control because of petty reasons that I realized were stupid after being on the job for a couple of weeks. That friction sometimes bled over into the warehouse staff. On this day, the warehouse staff could not find a very particular widget for an important customer, so they called in Dory from Quality Control to find it while they moved on to other orders. Dory searched the warehouse from end to end, but could not find it either. She was out of breath when she came scurrying up to my cubicle for help. She said, OP, could you tell Mark that I have no clue where it is? I asked, you want me to tell Mark you have no clue? She replied, yes, please, with some urgency. I nodded, thanked the goddess for this opportunity, picked up the phone, pushed the PA button. Dory anxiously watched my every move because this widget was important. Slowly and clearly, I said, Mark, Dory has no clue where the widget is located. Mark, Dory is clueless. The entire place erupted in laughter. 
all the managers came out of their offices laughing and the warehouse and loading docks came to a standstill. This lasted for a good five minutes at least. The act of this huge group belly laugh was like a valve for all the pressure that had been building up over trying to keep up during our busy season. It totally changed the mood of the entire place for the better for a while. Fortunately, Dory was good natured and did not take offense. She laughed too because I had done exactly as she asked. Consequently, relations between office staff and quality control began to thaw along with our relationship with the warehouse staff. When I occasionally ventured out into the warehouse, people were much nicer and much more cooperative. It became a nicer place to work and all because of malicious compliance. And yes, they did find the widget. I don't work here, ma'am. I really cannot help you. Maybe call the police. I used to try to keep details of my job vague, but I recently put in my notice and will be moving to a completely different field, so I don't mind sharing a little more detail this time around. It will also help the story make more sense, hopefully. I work in residential property management, meaning I work at an apartment complex. Apartments are usually managed by a separate company, but mine is pretty cool as they own the properties they manage. They used to be a third party manager for some properties, but that was a long time ago and they no longer do that. Relevant, I promise. I just had a phone call from a lady asking if I had any affiliation with a competitor. I let her know that no, we don't. This is property name A and she currently lives at property name B, owned and managed by a completely different company. Now property name B does sound familiar and I realize it is a property we never owned but did used to manage, years ago. Confirmed with a coworker after this phone call that we hadn't had anything to do with the property since 2014. I tell the woman this. I should not have told the woman this. She immediately goes into her situation and asks me if we allow certain breeds of dogs. I tell her for the third time that I can't speak for her company, but that ours doesn't allow the breeds she's named unless they are support animals. Where I am, we cannot discriminate against breeds for support. She says she is terrified and scared for her life, and this guy is getting away with something and nothing is ever done about it. She says she doesn't want to involve the police and then mention my company by name, which is unusual. Most people know the name of the apartment complex they live in, but not usually the property management company. Also, she called a direct office phone number. The advertised phone number goes to our call center, so I have no idea how she found it. I don't think she was a current resident at our place because how would she know about property name B? Anyway, back to the story. I try to tell her to call their office and she interrupts me to angrily say they never answer the phone and are never inside the office. I tell her that I would tell my own residents, again referencing that I don't work for her apartment complex, that if they ever feel in danger they should call the police. She gives me more details that I can't do anything about and she gets even more upset. I'm not annoyed that she was angry on the phone. Feeling scared at the place you live is a legit reason to be upset, but I cannot possibly do anything about it. After my police comment, she said she sees how it is and hung up on me. No fun resolution, just a leasing agent left scratching her head. The end. She only wants to pay me $20 a day for caring for 14 animals. Before I begin, I'm going to acknowledge that this entire mess is partly my fault. I agreed to watch my mom's co-worker's animals for 5 days and didn't set a price. I made the mistake of expecting her to name a fair price for my work. Big, big mistake. As I said, I get a call from my mom's coworker saying that she was going out of town and needed someone to care for her 14 animals. She explained the different animals, nine ducks that live in her bathrooms, three dogs and two cats. She explained what she would need to be done, food and water, as well as cleaning the ducks. Now, I had never cared for ducks or even seen one outside of the park. So when she understated the amount of care that would go into all of these animals, I believed her. I got there the night before her trip and she showed me what needed to be done. Turns out the dogs were barely house trained and one of them was a semi-aggressive pit bull. They needed to be fed twice a day with homemade warmed up food. The nine ducks did not have enough room to exercise and the way they were set up made cleaning hazardous and difficult. I was told I had to let them roam around the house as they were not allowed outside and clean up the mess. They also required a homemade fruit stand daily and to refill their water dishes several times a day as they often tipped them over. Each cleaning and feeding needed to be performed twice daily. The cats were honestly pretty easy. Food and water twice a day. Pretty average and expected cat care. No issues with them. At this point, I felt very deceived as she hadn't fully explained how much work was required. 
There were also a lot of little extra details, like medicating several of the animals, etc. But unfortunately, I felt responsible for my commitment and accepted the job anyways. Now, the stay was awful. The pit bull was terrifying, and several times the barking and lunging sent me into a full-on panic attack. Also, because I didn't get any warning about his habits. I walked in one day to find that the ducks were indeed capable of escaping the shower, and he had torn one of them apart, in the house. It was horrible. After making the owner aware of the situation, I was told that he had to sleep inside of the laundry room for the remainder of the stay. Each night, he went to the bathroom all over the place and I had to clean it up. Along with a difficult stay, her house was about 30 minutes out of town, with no Wi-Fi or cell phone service. I also was in charge of picking her up and dropping her off at the airport. When she got home, she handed me a bundle of cash and I made another mistake of not counting it until I got home. This woman is very wealthy and I assumed that she was going to pay a fair price since she could afford it. Turns out, she had only paid me $100. I did the math and found out that that was only $3.30 an hour. That's being generous, as I probably spent more time than that. This morning, I made her aware of the situation and told her that the pay hadn't even covered fuel. She responded that she didn't pay by the hour and instead by the day. I'm not sure why she thought that was a good defense, honestly. I'm currently in the process of trying to get more cash. I asked for 60 a day instead. Fortunately, she still thinks that I'll be coming back for her two other trips later next month, and she also works with my mother. I won't be coming back, but I'm prepared to let her think that. I am currently in between work, and without that money, I won't be able to eat, so it's a survival situation. I'm not sorry. The fact that she thinks that paying solely fuel costs for 14 animals when a single dog costs an average of $50 a night to board is unbelievably entitled. I'm aware that I didn't set a price and I made a lot of mistakes in not counting the money. I didn't get her back from the airport until 1am in my defense. I'm still very upset that I basically have done all of this work for free. Edit in case there's any confusion, the job is already over. She got home last night. Fake stepmom thinks I'm going to pay for her living. Long backstory short, I've lived with my father, well, forever. He got married to a woman, Patricia, for a green card in about 2008-ish. It was always for the green card. I know, wrong, blah, blah, blah. She needed money because she had just been fired and her daughter was having health problems. Her mother encouraged her to drink and smoke. Wonder why the health problems were there. So my father made her an employee so she'd make the minimum wage to sponsor him, $500 a week. She did nothing. She lived in Alabama while we lived in Georgia. He got his green card. He continued to pay her because he was an idiot and didn't get a prenup. I lived with him and worked for him. Legit worked for him. So I saw and dealt with him every day. We were close. I had my first child in August of 2019, his only grandchild. He was diagnosed with cancer in August of 2019 too. I helped him through all his medical stuff, took over as much of the business as I could, was his home care provider when he was in hospice, and he passed in June. When he was diagnosed, he made a will saying absolutely nothing was to go to his wife. Everything went to me or my son. The house was put in my name with a quit claim deed. The cars were all transferred. His and her relationship consisted of her literally texting him throughout the week asking for more money. Hubby, I need more money. Please deposit. My love, I need more money. I have bills. Husband, I need you to pay my taxes now. Even though I made more than her, she paid 3000 plus more in taxes and refused to use our legit accountants too. This was constant. He was never rich and his company is small and still has bad seasons. He didn't even tell her when he had a heart attack in 2016. He didn't tell her when I was pregnant. Didn't tell her when he was diagnosed until a month before he passed. He called her begging for help because he felt like a burden to me and he figured he was paying her so she could at least help. She never showed. In Georgia, a wife is entitled to one year of support. So I told her in the middle of lockdown, I was dropping her money to $300 a week. I didn't tell her my father had passed a month before. I did tell her myself and two employees had to take pay cuts because of lockdown. Truth. The very next day, she showed up at my house and just walked in. I told her she yelled at me. She had brought her mother. She yelled at me. She made a big deal about wanting to meet her grandson, my son, and how much her and my father loved each other. Lie. My father hated her. She left and I thought it was over. I was going to continue to pay her $300 and nothing else. Then the threats started. 
How dare I have lied to her? How dare I cremate him? His choice. I had to have her approval. I needed to pay her more because it's what he would have wanted. She also was going to come and take what belonged to her, his ashes and all of his personal belongings. She left the purse with him with some immigration stuff in it, which she also wanted. I told her to buzz off. A couple days passed. I went to visit a friend two hours away on a Saturday. She showed up at my work, demanding I meet her there right then and now to give her all of her stuff, including my father's laptops, phones, and ashes. She threatened to break in, call the cops on me, everything. I was literally in tears on the phone with my immigration lawyer, the probate lawyer, and 911. Both lawyers are wonderful people and knew if I called on a Saturday, it was an emergency. They eventually left, telling me on the phone that I was a jerk and they were going to get me, Patricia and her mom. Drama happens and I hear nothing from them. I've been paying the $300 a week. She texted me today asking when I was going to pay her taxes. I said never. She told me it was my job to pay them. That's what my father would have wanted because he loved her and didn't want us to be like this. I told her all I had to do, according to law and will, was pay her one year of support, which I was doing since the day he passed. She flipped out and called me a liar and how much my father loved her and he had never want this to happen to her. The jerk expected me to continue to pay for everything for her until when? She passes? I must pay her cable, her taxes, her everything. Entitlement. Edit. I never expected to get this response. Normally I get a couple people, but the amounts of people reinforcing how entitled she is gives me new fire to continue ignoring her craziness and drop her as soon as I can. Thank you all for the awards as well. I don't often get any, and I was really excited. Have you ever had anyone try to use you for money? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Parents mocked my business, so I kicked them out. My parents forced me to study a STEM degree that I had no interest in. I wanted to be a photographer. I ended up dropping out after two years. I worked a minimum wage job while I built up a clientele. I had a pretty successful Insta page and started a side hustle helping other photographers and companies to set up social media profiles. I was pretty fed up with living on the grind and one of my friends was starting a business and asked if I could manage their social media full time. I had some money saved up and I bought a small share in the business too. It was pretty tough going for a while, but our business has really taken off over the last two years. We raised money about a year ago and I sold some of my stake in the business. We used it as a down payment for our home. My parents never took my career seriously and they always assumed that I was just wasting my boyfriend's money and that he was humoring me because he loved me. I've tried correcting them, but it doesn't work at all. We're married now and we bought a new home. I invited them over to dinner and they were just praising him for buying the house. They had assumed that he had bought the house. He corrected them and said I had contributed more to the down payment, but they just laughed it off and said we didn't have to lie to them. I have worked really hard to get here. I don't know if I made the right choice dropping, but I made it work for me. I told them to get out of my house. It was rude and they were very shocked, but I doubled down and said I didn't want them here. They ended up leaving and they were very hurt. I feel like a jerk because I kicked my parents out of my house. I have hurt their feelings and I ruined their night. It was supposed to be a good day and everyone is now upset. My brother is understanding and he thinks I shouldn't have invited them over in the first place. Am I the jerk for setting an 11 p.m. curfew on my husband? I know, I know, he's a grown man, but let me explain. We have a four month old together and not once has he helped out beyond changing a diaper maybe once a week. I do all of the cooking, cleaning, and 99% of the baby care has been on me. I've asked him to take an overnight shift before, but he snapped back at me saying, I work, so I need my sleep, so I can put food on the table for you. To be honest, that stung, but I dropped it after that. Anyway, weekdays he works all day and he's so exhausted when he comes home, he only wants to hang out or play games with his brothers and drink beer. I tell him I appreciate him working so I can take care of our son and go to school. I cook, I clean, and I do his laundry so he can just rest. Weekends he doesn't work, so I feel like he can help out a little more. On top of being a full-time mom, I'm also finishing up my final semester in college. So on weekends, he had agreed to watch the baby for at least an hour so I can submit assignments on time, which is usually the Sunday at 11.59 kind of deal. Or let me take a shower, since the kid is glued to my hip the rest of the day. Hence the 11pm curfew. 
so I have an hour to do my timed exams, which is just enough time for me to complete. He has yet to respect the agreed upon time for him to come home, so not only can I shower and get schoolwork done, we can spend quality time as husband and wife since he's busy all week and goes out every weekend. When he told his brothers and coworkers about his curfew, I was immediately labeled as a controlling, nagging jerk wife, and it hurt. I don't argue with him, and my requests are asked in a calm and collected manner. I have an exam due on Sunday. Can you make some time to help me so I can knock it out? I guess if you're not there, it's easy to assume. Despite that, he won't come home on weekends until 1 or 2 a.m., ignoring my text when I remind him of my timed exams and homework. Then he snaps at me because I don't let him reward himself for working all week. I'm really hurt at the name calling. I pride myself in being laid back, flexible, and understanding. Am I the jerk here? Should I just forget about the curfew? Edit, just so I'm not repeating myself. English is not my first language. I didn't realize until now that the word curfew has a negative meaning behind it. I didn't mean to belittle him. That's on me. Also, thanks for all of the support. I didn't expect that. I'm definitely looking around into finding a good counselor for us. I've already called our insurance and got a list of names. We had a solid marriage before the baby. If we can work it out, I'd like to do that. Until then, I'm looking into a local mom group to get some support until I finish college. Or the counseling works and my husband steps up. Update. So many of you have been so supportive of me and I can't thank you enough for it. Even though you're strangers on Reddit, it means a lot to me to be cheered on to continue my education and caring for my son. For info, my husband wasn't always like this. Eight years together and he always helped me somehow. Chores, encouraging me to change my degree at the age of 24 because I was just miserable, supporting me when my best friend backstabbed me, staying up all night and taking eight days off work when I miscarried for our first so that he could take care of me. You guys helped me realize these red flags and the courage to realize I need to put my foot down. Being laid back isn't going to save our marriage. Last night when my husband got home, we sat down and talked, really talked. We stayed up late. I told him we need counseling or I'll leave if this continues and that I'm going to my only family about 2,000 miles away so there won't be a chance of seeing either one of us unless he flies out. By the look on his face, I guess he didn't realize how bad it had become. The thing he joked to coworker and brothers, apparently only the collective three, was something they said. In the moment, he had laughed it off. He didn't realize this locker room talk would affect me. He said he will stop them and never call me that again. This morning, I woke up to breakfast and coffee at my bedside. I got a text asking if I'd like to go grocery shopping while he watches the baby when he gets home today, so I have an hour or two to myself and I can get out of the house. I hope it keeps getting better. We've had a good eight years together. If possible, I'd like to continue that. One more thing. To the people calling me names and saying it's my fault for marrying him, it's easy to assume that when you weren't there. It's hard to put my entire relationship with this man into one Reddit post. Thanks everyone. Bear hugs all around. My safety vest strikes again, manhandled in my wheelchair. So, I've posted before about my safety vest. Due to being in a wheelchair and people around where I live being utterly vapid, knuckle-dragging and mouth-breathing Neanderthals that don't pay attention, I'm pretty much forced to wear this high-visibility yellow-green safety vest. Where I run into my most constant issue is at a local supermarket. It's owned by Kroger, but locally we know it as Fred Meyer or Fred Myers. Their trolley boys, cart wranglers, all wear nearly identical safety vests to mine, only theirs actually have black trim added to the vest along with Fred Meyer plastered on the left side and the back. That and the only employees actually have name tags on. I look like a biker by comparison with my beard, heavy tattoos, all black clothes, and I top it off with a pride 49ers hat. I mean, the hat alone should be a clear sign I don't work there, but nope. I should also point out that I'm a voice actor. When I'm out in public, I speak with a posh North London English accent as I found due to implicit bias, people tend to treat me better. This comes into play here. The event. This happened Friday evening. I headed out to perform what I call the double whammy, picking up my prescriptions from the pharmacy inside Fred Meyer and doing a bit of food shopping. I waved or greeted my regular employees and manager as I'm in there so much and so often that I'm pretty recognizable. Between my, as I'm told, natural charisma and my appearance, I'm often greeted back warmly, or they greet me initially with politeness in a generally friendly atmosphere by the staff at my supermarket. I had wheeled my chair into the soup aisle. 
There were so many delicious options that I couldn't decide on what to get. I can be a bit indecisive, and trust me when I say never shop hungry. I don't think I was in the aisle more than five minutes when I hear the throat clearing Ahem, emanate from behind me. I ignore it because I have no idea if it's meant for me or what not. It happens again and I continue to ignore it. That's when this lady grabbed the handles on my wheelchair and spun me around. It took every ounce of effort not to turn and swing on her because I had no idea who she was or what her intentions were. But obviously, she had no qualms over grabbing someone's wheelchair and maneuvering them against their will. Before I could say a single word, our Karen in this situation starts to shout, Hey, when a customer is trying to get your attention, you don't ignore them. I've been trying to get your attention for minutes now. She hadn't, and I don't like your attitude. I take a deep breath and do my best to unclench my hands from the armrests of my wheelchair. Madam, I'm sorry if I have offended you. I wasn't, but I must inform you that I was cut off. Due to my mental quirks and conditioning as a kid, anytime I'm interrupted, I get shut completely down and I just can't speak until the other person stops talking, so I went silent. I don't want to hear any of your excuses. Just because you're in a wheelchair doesn't mean you can get away with being an inconsiderate jerk. The world doesn't revolve around you. That's rich. And there are other people in the world far more in need than you. I have half a mind to wheel you over to the service desk and report you to management. I waited a couple of beats, waiting to see if her rant was going to continue, but it didn't. She gave me a look that I could without any measure of difficulty correctly identify as a your move glare. I take another deep breath. Mom, firstly it's illegal and socially irresponsible and outright tactless to manhandle a person's disability conveyance without their consent. That counts as assault. While yelling and screaming at me isn't illegal per se, I don't appreciate it. Tell me, mum, what incentive do I have to assist you at this point? I don't work here. Look me over. I don't have a name tag on. I'm in black jeans and a t-shirt with a gay pride 49ers hat on that clearly isn't a uniform. I'm just wearing a safety vest for my safety. Karen looks like she was about to blow her skullcap with the force of Mount St. Helens, Krakatoa, and Tambora combined. I honestly don't remember what she said next. It was something about the typical, How dare you! Stacked with her rant about disabled people always thinking that we can get away with things. That was when she lived up to her thread. She stepped around me, grabbed the handles, and began to push me. I was so bewildered that I froze because I never in a thousand years would have thought she would actually do this. Now, I could have pulled the brake handles on my chair, but that would mean I'd have to take my hands off the merchandise basket in my lap, which would cause it to slip out once we stopped abruptly. Top that off with the fact that Karen would smack into my back and the back of my head, and I didn't want that. Two of the regular checkout attendants at the self-checkout area noticed me being pushed against my will towards customer service. I can just catch one I'm more familiar with, for the purpose of this story, let's call him Owen. Owen immediately gets on his radio. Before I could do anything more, we were at the desk. Karen immediately starts slapping her hand on the counter in that typical, hey, barkeep, kind of manner. A manager, a woman in her late 20s or early 30s, will call her Amanda, turns to the Karen. Amanda is quite tall and loaded down with Marvel comic tattoos, and we're very familiar with one another. Karen launches into a full-blown tirade, accusing me of this and that, and everything from incompetence to an all-out disregard for customer service. Amanda just blinked and said, Um, he doesn't work here. What do you mean he doesn't work here? He's wearing a safety vest, and your employees wear the same ones. Well, ours say Fred Meyer on them. We also issue name tags for all employees for transparency, so if you have an issue, you know who they are. OP is a customer, He's in here at least four times a week. I could hear the hamster wheels turning in Karen's head. So, he doesn't work here? Let me speak to the store manager just in case. Amanda sighed, picked up her phone, and began to call the store manager. However, that call didn't finish as the head of Fred Meyer security, let's call him Clark, came striding over looking quite upset. Clark is a mountain of a man, six foot five, 250 pounds, and built like a lumberjack. Ma'am, what are you doing to OP? You really just grabbed a disabled person's wheelchair and moved them without their consent? Well, I... That wasn't a question. 
You don't do that. Not at my store. But I... Can it? You need to come with me right now. If looks could kill, I'd be twice dead over between Karen's You little jerk! Glare and Clark's You done messed up! Look, meant for Karen. Karen was escorted off to the security area in the back, sputtering like an old Edsel. Amanda asked if I was alright. I said I wasn't really, that things had been difficult for me this last week. I won't disclose them here, and this really spiked my anxiety. I'm just going to go home. Amanda did her best to comfort me. She stepped out of the booth and patted me on the shoulder. Owen, the self-checkout attendant, also asked if I was okay. I said I wasn't really. He offered, if I was comfortable, to push me back out to my car, and I accepted. Amanda gave me a card and told me that when I was ready, I could use that number to have my groceries delivered and for my trouble, she'd waive the fee for delivery. I thanked her and said that would be best for now. Owen wheeled me out to my car, helped me get my wheelchair in my trunk, and I drove home. Edit. At the behest of several readers, my husband, and my immediate friends and family, I've set up an appointment to speak with the store manager, Clark, the security lead, and my local sheriff to go about filing official charges. Entitled man at a hockey game tried to kick me out of my seats. So this happened several years ago, probably around 2012 or so. A little bit of background. My dad was a diehard fan of our local NHL team and had season tickets for longer than I was alive, which was 23 years at that point. After having them for that long, he had managed to secure some pretty awesome seats. Section 219, which is on the second tier of the stadium, but the front row seats, which have an arguably unbeatable view of the game. Growing up, I went to tons of games with him, but by this point, he was getting old and it was tougher for him to make it to the games himself. So he was nice enough to let my boyfriend, now ex, and I use his tickets to go to the games together. And this wasn't the first time we had done that. So we made it to the game and had been sitting and watching for a good amount of time. Then, I want to say early second period, a seemingly nice man came up into our section and walked up to my ex and I. We would be the easiest to talk to, as we were the closest to the entrance, being in the first row, so it seemed logical someone would just be asking a random question to the most convenient people that he found. He was followed by three other people, and for context, there happened to be two empty seats next to us. Here's how the conversation went. Seemingly nice man. We've got the entitled man, and we've got the nice man. Seemingly nice man. Hi there, is this section 219? Me. Yes, you're in the right place. It takes me a few seconds to then comprehend the look quickly spreading on seemingly nice man's face. A disgusting look of self-righteousness, a smile that sneered, Yes, poor young person, I am perfectly aware of where I am. He then puts out his hand palm up and gestures with his fingers as if saying, Come here, to me. I realize this man is in fact not a seemingly nice person, but instead an entitled man. Entitled man, in a seriously comically annoying voice out of nowhere, and also while shaking his head. Gotta go! Your time's up enjoying our seats. Back to where you came from! Entitled man then points his other thumb, the one not continuously gesturing as described above, up to the top of the stadium, then looks back and laughs at his family. This was not quietly, by the way. I'm a super friendly and non-confrontational person, so I was dumbstruck. I don't think I could find any words, just probably sat with my mouth hanging slightly open. Not at all sure what to do next. My ex did not say anything either. He wasn't super familiar with the place and might have even wondered if we were in the wrong seats since this guy seemed so sure these couldn't possibly be our seats. Thankfully, we didn't need much time to compose ourselves. One of the men in the group sitting directly behind us piped up. Mind you, this group are also season ticket holders, so likely they recognize me. Nice man. Hey. Let me see your tickets. Entitled man, not super thrilled we aren't immediately doing his bidding, pulled out his ticket and shows it to nice man. Nice man. Wow, you're in row 19, not row 1, sir. I think it's time you go back to where you came from. Nice man then does the same palm up hand gesture entitled man introduced us to and yells, Gotta go. A small but powerful crowd around us started chanting, Gotta go, as well until the now red-faced entitled man sheepishly put his hand up saying, Okay, okay, and leads his family through the crowd up the stairs to row 19. I have never felt so supported by strangers in my life. Unfortunately, I also had to meet one of the most entitled men first for that to happen. Thanks for letting me share this story. 
don't pass any moving cars. So my high school sits back away from a highway and the parking lot stays open for about one and a half hours before and after school. There's an administrator at the school whose job it is to stay in the parking lot and watch the cars to make sure nobody's doing anything wrong since it's a large school with a huge parking lot. Many people I know have complained about him, but he's never given me a hard time. When you turn off the highway, there's a 1 8 mile straight road driving up to where the parking lot entrance is, so people typically go relatively fast through it. However, some people go crawling slow. Now the road is two lanes, with the left lane going to the bottom of the parking lot and the right to the top. One day I was coming in like I always do, about 15 miles per hour. Of course, there's a sophomore who's freshly got their license going five in the right lane, but I go to the bottom anyway, so I just drive past them and park, just fine. But as I get my backpack out of my trunk, administrator walks up to me and he starts talking. You running late this morning? Me, I guess so. Did the parking lot start closing earlier? Well, I just saw you passing cars on the way in. No, I did. I just watched you pass a car. Me, finally understanding what he's talking about. Oh, we're not allowed to pass cars coming in? Sorry, won't do. You'll get a warning this time. But next time, I'll take your plate and get your parking tag taken. Now this really ticked me off because I've been driving to school for three years and never had a problem with my speed, much less for passing. Me. So we can't pass cars in here, even if they're going slow? A. You shouldn't be passing any moving vehicles. Bad wording. For the next few days, I started going slowly into the parking lot and taking footage of people passing me to A to ask him what he'd do about it. When he eventually admitted he didn't care, I asked him why not. Now he didn't have an answer. On Friday of that week, one of my friends was broken down in the road next to the lot. So I told him my plan and got him on board with what I wanted to do. Typically, when broken down here, you roll your car to the lot in neutral and leave it in the lot until it's fixed. But I wasn't allowed to pass. I parked behind him and waited for friend number two to show up. They started pushing the car while I idled and rode right next to them. After about five minutes, the VP came up. He asked me what I was doing and I told him I was following the rules that administrator made and he should go get him. VP tells me to just go, but I insist on following the parking manager's rules. At this point, 10 cars were lined up in either lane, getting more upset by the minute. Administrator comes up with vice principal, and A immediately looks like he just tasted a lemon. He tells me to just pass people as long as I drive safe. Other than odd looks, he never gave me a hard time again, but he still leaves extra warning notes on my car for petty things, such as parking too far over in my space, or not having headlights on instead of running lights. No random lady, your bratty daughter cannot ride my horse. I, 20 female, was grooming my horse Clyde yesterday when a woman came up to me, tugging along a kid around 6 or 7. For context, the stable hands slash trainers don't need to wear specific clothes, although they usually wear the stable shirts to be more recognizable towards new people. I was wearing some tan breeches and a red polo, nothing really special but I tended to get confused as staff pretty often, which I understand. The Karen was wearing way too expensive looking clothes to be at a barn, but I assumed she was just going to drop off her kid and come back at the end of the lesson. As I saw her direct her attention towards me, I prepared my whole speech about how I didn't work there and where I could direct you to. Before I could even get a word out, she launched into a tirade about how terrible the service was and how she had spent hours trying to find someone to help her. I doubt it was more than five minutes. This table wasn't that big. Oh, I don't, I began, being cut off by her screaming in my face to let her kid ride my horse. I tried to calmly explain that no, her kid could not ride my horse. And no, she could not let her ride any other horses in the barn. No matter what I said, I couldn't convince her that I didn't work there and that she couldn't just let her daughter ride. Clyde is not fully trained as I recently got him and he's still very young and inexperienced. I wouldn't even let a kid clean him as he tends to nip at people. The kid proceeded to try and duck past me and tried to pet his nose. I grabbed the kid's shoulder and gently pushed her back, genuinely worried about Clyde biting her. Karen gasped and screamed, My daughter has every right to touch that horse. She's probably even better with horses than you are. Besides, you're just a worker, so don't you dare push my kid. That made me blow a gasket. Your daughter is not going to touch my horse. 
He is not suitable with kids and he could even injure her. Your daughter does not know more than me. I've been writing for 15 years and I don't work here. Leave me alone, I shouted, wanting to punch that Karen straight in the face. At this point, my horse was starting to freak out and I turned to lead him back to his stall and just calm him and myself. Some barn staff came running over, trying to find out what was happening. The woman kept screaming at me, but I just couldn't deal with her anymore and I walked away since the staff had her occupied. My friend who worked there told me they had to threaten to call the cops to get her to leave because she kept demanding to have her kid ride every single horse she saw. She is also banned from the stable now, so happy ending at least. What grade are you in? I'm the teacher. So I, 23, female at the time, am not a very tall person, 5 foot 3, but I'm very curvy and have not ever had the issue of being mistaken as a kid before, but I do have a baby face. This happened a couple of years back. I was taking a break between undergrad and grad school and had decided to teach for a year abroad. I had taught for a year in the States already, so when I got an opportunity to go abroad and continue teaching, I jumped at the chance. I decided to stay with my aunt and uncle for the summer between graduation and flying to Spain. My uncle worked part-time as a substitute school supervisor for the local districts, so most of the kids in the neighborhood easily recognized him. One day when he wasn't on call, we took a trip to the community pool because it gets really hot in my hometown and the AC just wasn't cutting it. We're treading water in the deep end, five feet, so my uncle can stand with his head above water. Me, less so. I'm treading water, but basically you can only see me from the chin up. A family enters the pool and the kids all jump right in the pool. One of the kids, 12-ish male, recognizes my uncle and comes over to join us. He says hi and introduces me as his niece and we start making small talk. Is he enjoying his summer? What grade is he starting? Which middle school is he going to, etc. Well, I've apparently piqued this kid's interest and he starts boasting about middle school, years 6 to 8 here, and he's already got friends in the 7th grade and he's going to do soccer, etc. I smile and nod and give the standard, yeah dude, that's super cool, to keep the conversation going. My uncle tries to redirect the conversation to put focus on him because I'm not trying to get hit on by this kid. Kid's not taking the bait though. He hits me with his smoothest, so what grade are you starting? My uncle loses it. He manages to stop laughing long enough to go, yeah OP, what grade are you starting? Me, I'm actually a teacher. The kid immediately turns red as a tomato. My uncle is laughing even harder now. Kid, mortified. Wh what grade do you teach? Me. Preschool. He gave the biggest sigh of relief and my uncle again starts laughing. The rest of the summer, my uncle would razz me about, what grade are you starting? Until I was getting on the plane to my new job in Spain. Sorry kiddo, I won't get to hang with your cool 7th grade friends. I do work here. Am I the jerk for being mad my fiancé took $3,000 without my consent? Me, 26, female, and my fiancé, 32, male, have been engaged for five months now and we're getting married in October. Ever since we got engaged, my fiancé and I just started to start saving up for our wedding so we opened a joint bank account. We have a good sum of money. My fiancé does not put in as much money as I do because he stopped working for a month after we opened the account and it's just me saving up for it now. My fiancé's mom is an absolutely awful person. She always tries to belittle me and says offensive stuff to me, but I just try to ignore her and keep the peace. I heard my mother-in-law was remodeling her kitchen and that her two daughters contributed and she started calling my fiancé to pay his share. He told her he didn't have the money and the topic was dropped. Yesterday, I went to the bank and found out that my fiancé took $3,000 from our joint account without telling me. At first, I thought it was a mistake but the money was indeed taken by him. I was confused, but he had a habit of taking money from me so he could buy his mom a birthday present, pay to fix her car, and said he would pay me back, but he never did. And I thought since we're now as one, I can't possibly ask him to return the money. Plus, it wasn't that much. I went home and I confronted him about the $3,000. First, he apologized and said he was planning on telling me earlier, but his mom was pressuring him and thought I'd say no if he asked for money. I got so mad at him for this and I started yelling at him, asking him how could he do this and that now we don't have enough money for the wedding. His tone changed, saying that since I make more than what I need, then he saw nothing wrong with helping his family. My job pays a little above average, but that doesn't mean I don't work hard for it. He basically got defensive. I was so angry I left the apartment, literally crying after we argued for some time. 
His mom called and it turned out he lied to his family that the money was his since it was a joint account. She lashed out at me and said that I was trying to isolate him from his family and yelling at him for his contribution. I was stunned. I blocked her immediately and I'm no longer responding to his calls trying to say that he loves me and that is worth billions. Saying he'll pay me back when he gets a job, but it doesn't seem likely. I work there, I work here. I do not work there and here. For starters, I have three jobs. A manager at a fast food restaurant, a volunteer staff member at my church, and one of those makeup companies reps, where you make your own hours. Pay is all based off commission and I mostly join to get good discounts on their products that I love and make an extra buck. I've done this for a bit now and I love my busy little life. I never considered something like this happening, but here we go. I was at the church, doing some things in the kitchen. Because of what's going on, we can no longer serve coffee. But before service, I always make a pot for those who come early to help set up, so mostly staff and the worship team. While I was in there, a lady I don't know too well, who doesn't come often, came in to talk to me. I don't mind the company and we started talking, even though technically she was not supposed to be in the kitchen. After the exchange of a few pleasantries is when it started. Lady. So, you're the manager at Exburger, right? Me. Yep. They are super great there working around my church schedule and giving me special days off for events. Lady. Alright, so I need you to make sure they make my burger right after service. I want no pickles and extra mayo, large combo with a Coke or a Pepsi, whichever you have. I'll be right by after church, so have it ready for me, okay? Me. I'm sorry, but I'm not working right now. You can call the store and place your order, or do it through the app, but I'm working here right now. Lady, shocked. But you are a manager! I need my order placed. I don't want to have to wait in line forever. Me. I'm not on the clock. I'm not in uniform. I have work to do here. Lady. You don't work here. You work at Exburger. Me. I work here and there. When I'm here, I'm part of the staff. When I'm at Exburger, I am an Exburger manager. I work here tonight. I can show you how to use the app or give you the store number, but I can't place an order for you. Lady. No. I don't want to have to bother with all that nonsense. I'll just have to go to X Taco instead. I just don't understand why, as an Exburger employee, you can't just make my food for me after church. You work there, it's your job, and you get paid to do it. After that, she just left the kitchen, which I didn't have much time to think on because I had work to do. She refused to look at me until after the service when she pulled the head pastor aside and was saying something, shooting daggers at me. I paid it no mind. Again, I had work to do and I didn't want to assume she was talking about me. Whatever she has to say to pastor is none of my business. Just before she left, she came up to me, gave me the most fake smile I've ever seen and said she was sorry for bugging me when I had so much important work to be doing and that I should have told her I had work to do. She still rarely comes and acts like nothing ever happened. Pastor never told me what she said, but made a big point to tell me that I was doing a great job that night. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.